Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's Fleet Decarbonisation Roadshow, Birmingham. My name is George Barrow, Deputy Editor of Commercial Motor, and I'll be chairing today's webinar for you on what I understand is actually National Clean Air Day. Now, the past five years have seen a huge political, legal and media spotlight shone on the issue of poor air quality in UK towns. Starting with London and now expanding out to cities across the UK, such as Bath and Birmingham, the introduction of clean air zones is one radical strategy the government hopes will address the challenge. But much more is needed to be done, not just on local air quality, but on the wider agenda of reducing CO2 emissions. The UK has therefore set itself a binding target in law to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 when compared with 1990 levels. Net zero means any emissions will be balanced by schemes to offset an equivalent amount of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, such as planting trees or using technology like car carbon capture and storage. But what does that mean for the road transport sector and what journey do operators need to take to meet the government objectives? We've brought together a fantastic lineup of speakers this morning to provide insight into how decarbonisation might be achieved at city level, national level and by freight operators themselves. You'll be guided on the latest technology coming to market and ways that your operation may be able to take its first steps in a transition away from fossil fuels. Our first session this morning will focus on policy, strategy and infrastructure with speakers from Birmingham City Council, Zemo Partnership and Tysley Energy Park. We'll then take a Q&A session with those speakers before moving on to our second session, Operating Factors, which is full of practical know-how and knowledge sharing. You can submit questions at any time by using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and just please state who your question is for when you do this. A recording will be made from today's session and you'll receive a link tomorrow to access it free of charge on freightandcity.com. Right, let's move on to our next speaker, Councillor Zafar, Cabinet Member for Transport and Environment at Birmingham City Council. Hello, Councillor. Hi, George. Thank you for the introduction there. I'm just going to share some slides, which I hope you can now see. Um, happy Clean Air Day to everybody. Um, it's, it's a really important day, uh, particularly important for us here in Birmingham, because uh, as George said, we, on the 1st of uh, June, uh, we launched our Clean Air Zone in the city, uh, the biggest um, project uh, of its sort outside London uh, and something that's going to be a, a get us to legally compliant levels in the, in the shortest possible time. Um, but as I'm going to be talking through, this is not the only thing that Birmingham City Council are, are doing. Um, so as George said, we, it's, it's really important that we all look to not just improve air quality, but to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, to, to achieve net zero. Uh, the government's targets are 2050 here in the West Midlands, uh, uh, the net zero targets that the combined authority and the Conservative mayor have set is 2041. Uh, but we've been bold and brave as a local authority uh, and the work that we've been doing with, part with partners right across the city, we've set the bold target of being carbon neutral by 2030, uh, which is going to take a lot of effort, in particular around transport. Um, a third of Birmingham CO2 emissions are, are linked to transport. So, uh, we, we've got to uh, take some very strong steps uh, beyond the clean air zone to get there and, and a switch to electric and hydrogen vehicles will be really important. I love sharing stats and one of the stats I'm going to share with you is, um, uh, you know, e each normal day, working day in Birmingham, uh, pre-COVID, there was 11.5 uh, million uh, vehicle miles travelled in the city. Uh, we know uh, just over 9 million of these uh, miles are by car. Uh, whereas just over 2 million are by um, uh, other means. So it's how we can start to shift people away from using car, particularly those, you know, single occupancy cars are uh, a particular challenge. You know, Birmingham's always had this strong love for private car, but it's important, you know, whilst car will always have a, um, a role in the city, it's how we can reset that relationship to ensure that um, people are using uh, other modes, modes of transport too. Uh, so. Birmingham's taking some strategic actions uh, to, to, to get to carbon neutral. Uh, obviously, I talked about the clean air zone, which, which went live uh, a few weeks ago. We've also pulled together a 12-year uh, EV charge, charge point strategy. Uh, so by um, 20, the end of 2022, we will have 394 uh, fast and rapid charges. Uh, but we obviously have to expand on this substantially leading up to 2030. Um, we've we've bought 20 hydrogen buses that our partners at National Express will be having on the road um, by September. 
Um, and we're working very closely with partners such as Taizy Energy Park and ensuring that we've got the refueling, uh, refueling infrastructure available for those buses. But that for me is just the, the tip of the iceberg. We've got major plans to have hundreds more hydrogen buses in Birmingham. In fact, we want Birmingham to be the test bed for hydrogen buses in the country. Uh, and we want to have more hydrogen buses in Birmingham than anywhere else in the world. And we're going to be, we're going to be uh, pulling out some very bold plans uh, and a very bold vision around this too. Um, and we want it not just to be around hydrogen buses, but looking at all vehicles and how we, we, we can start to uh, develop um, some strategy around that. Uh, policy is really, really important. And the draft Birmingham transport plan, which we consulted on last year, we will be adopting very soon, uh, creates a, an environment which will enable us to start to shift some of those car journeys uh, into more sustainable modes. So you might have seen if you've come across Birmingham, the, the city centre started to uh, evolve where um, private cars are discouraged from going through the, the city centre, whereas public transport, walking and cycling is encouraged. We're also looking at how to really improve on the bus reliability in the city. And the key um, catalyst to that will be uh, improving road allocation and giving priority to, to buses um, in, in the city. Uh, we've got a whole host of walking and cycling schemes, particularly rolling out the uh, segregated cycling. Just over the, the last 12 months, we've got, I think, 15 kilometres of um, pop-up cycle lanes, which many of which will make permanent in the, in, the, in the coming few months too. And we're also looking at how parking is used as a means to encourage or discourage people to drive into various locations, particularly the city centre too. So we're looking at some CPZ, some control parking zones, and, and, and also looking at how we can um, replace some of the free car parking we've got to, uh, to, to, to ensure that people have to pay, which may act as a deterrent for them to drive in and, and, in, and encourage them onto to public transport too. But one thing we're absolutely clear about in this city, if, if we replace every single vehicle on the road right now, every single petrol and diesel vehicle, vehicle into an electric vehicle, that's not going to resolve our issues. We will still have the challenges around congestion, we'll still have the challenges around greenhouse gas emissions. So I think it's really important that we start to encourage people into other modes of transport, more sustainable modes of transport. Uh, but we absolutely are clear that as part of our EV charging uh, in, uh, strategy, we need to ensure that there's uh, good uh, accessibility for communities. My ward of Lazelles has terrace housing. Um, people can't install EV chargers. So how are we going to ensure that they have the EV infrastructure for them to uh, change their vehicles to, to, to EV vehicles uh, too? So it's about how we can, we can look at it doing that. We also have to uh, enable refueling infrastructure. And as I said earlier, Taizy Energy Park, um, uh, and I know you'll be hearing from David shortly, but um, they, they've been sort of really not just developing a whole host of infrastructure, they are piloting all sorts of technology that have been really pushing us and encouraging us and challenging us to do a lot more as well, which I think is a brilliant role uh, for, for somebody working uh, from the private sector too. And I think it's really important that we take a holistic approach that supports low emissions technology uh, alongside uh, air quality improvement and the model shift. So it's about bringing everything together, not just looking at doing things in silo. Um, so very quickly, as I come to the conclusion, um, you know, th this is the sort of timeline we're following. We know where we are right now. We've got ESB Energy as the council's procured EV partner. Uh, they'll help us not just uh, put the EV out, uh, infrastructure out there, but also develop strategy and a vision uh, around this and to continue to develop our vision. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole host of activity that we're looking to do, not just around electric, but as I said earlier, I think hydrogen and Birmingham will be something that uh, I, I strongly encourage people to keep a close eye on as, as we move forward um, into, into the next few years. Um, um, I know there'll be an opportunity uh, for questions that my colleague, um, Sylvia Broadley from the council will be able to address. I'm sorry, I've got, as you can imagine, all sorts of equipments because it's clean air day and uh, there's a whole host of activities taking part in the, in the city. I just want to say finally a big thank you to the organisers, a big thank you to the sponsors and supporters of this very, very important event um, and, and everyone that's tuned in. So a big thank you. Back to you, George. Very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, yes, we understand you've got a, a busy day ahead of you and uh, we'll get your colleague Sylvia back to answer the questions on your behalf. So thank you again for speaking. Um, don't forget, you can ask questions using the tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, please keep those coming in. Right, uh, on to our next speaker this morning, uh, Gloria Esposito from Zemo Partnership. 
Thank you very much, George. I'm delighted to be here today, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be providing a policy over overview, basically um, focusing on greenhouse gas emission reduction, very much on the uh, commercial vehicle fleet and meeting um, net zero. So just as background um, about Zemo partnership, we were formerly the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership and we've been in existence um, for around about 18 years now. We're an independent not-for-profit um, organization that brings together government, industry and a wide range of stakeholders in the field of um, zero emission mobility. We have over 200 uh, members and they cover a wide range of um, organizations from government bodies, environment and academia, financing and lease, um, the automotive industry, a range of um, OEMs, um, fleet operators uh, as well, and fuel providers, both fossil and renewable. And we play a key role in really helping UK government deliver its zero emission transport strategy. We also do a lot of work in air quality um, as well. And the areas that we work in are passenger cars, commercial vehicles, um, buses and coaches, energy infrastructure, and a range of um, low carbon and sustainable fuels. So I think George um, eloquently um, outlined earlier the importance of net zero and how um, that ambition has really now been embedded into policy. And we have a target now in the Clean Air, in the Climate Change Act to reach this set near to set near target by 2050. Road transport is responsible for 28% of emissions and that's growing compared to other, other sectors. And for heavy, heavy goods vehicles, um, that's around um, a, a contribution of around about 20% of greenhouse gas emissions, but they're only responsible for about 5% of, of, of those of the distance traveled, which is quite important. We also have um, vans as well, which have been growing really due to online deliveries, and they're about a 15% contribution to road transport emissions. As you can see here, this is the climate change um, six carbon budget. Um, we have to, the UK has to meet um, carbon budgets. They're embedded into policies, and these restrict the total amount of UK emissions over a five year period. And at the moment, we're in carbon budget six, which really lays out the reductions that we need in round about the 2035 period. And those have now been agreed to be a 78% reduction by 2035. But what we're seeing is for carbon budgets four and five, these aren't going to be met. So it's critically important that over the next 10 years that we really do ramp up measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, not only from the transport sector, but from other areas of the economy. And there's going to be a range of interventions that are going to be required um, to reach those long term targets. So government policy really is uh, focused on the long term transition to zero emission vehicle. So there's been a range of policies in place for nearly almost a decade now that have looked at both um, incentivizing both the supply and demand of a range of different low carbon vehicles, but in particular electric vehicles, there's been plug in van grants, there's been fiscal support for infrastructure, especially on street um, for individuals and for businesses as well. And there's also been moves to decarbonize the fuels that we use for the renewable transport fuels obligation, where there are mandates for increasing volumes of renewable fuels um, in, in transport and in non-road mobile machinery. Um, what we're seeing is over um, the next, um, hopefully in the next month, um, the Department for Transport will be publishing its transport decarbonization plan. And hopefully this will really set out um, a range of measures that will cover not only road transport, but rail, aviation and marine, and also look at passenger transport as well. It really is the strategy for meeting um, net zero and will not, over not only um, cover vehicles, but will also cover um, infrastructure as well. And there'll be a cross-cutting role for sustainable renewable fuels as well, looking both at probably road, road transport, aviation and, and the marine sector as well. So what I would say is keep an eye out for that plan because that will really lay out the policy uh, mechanisms going forward. More recently, um, uh, the government um, published its 10-point plan which really was the green industrial revolution in terms of a range of um, commitments there to really turning the economy towards meeting net, um, net zero. Now, some of the highlights in terms of, of transport 
Obviously, we've seen the end of new petrol and diesel ICE car sales. That commitment now has been cemented into policy, and that will take place um, by 2030, with an extension for hybrid vehicles to 2035 for cars and vans. But when it comes to um, the heavy duty vehicles, a consultation will be out, hopefully in the summertime, consulting on when that date um, will be for HGVs. Um, there's a contribution of 1.3 billion to accelerate the rollout um, of charging infrastructure, and that will really be focusing um, on rapid charging um, for light duty vehicles. In terms of the direction of travel um, for the heavy, heavy goods vehicles, that has yet um, to be decided, and there are a number of possible um, options here. And in terms of understanding more evidence and really looking at understanding the operational and cost requirements, a 20 million pound um, freight trial will be um, undertaken to really look at a number of different technologies, for example, hydrogen fuel cell, um, battery electric vehicles and catenary as well to understand how these could, uh, the role that these could play in, in meeting net zero going forward. So the next slide um, is quite a lot of information here. This is uh, the um, technology roadmap for, for heavy goods vehicles. It's been produced by the Automotive Council and the Advanced Propulsion Centre to really drive um, sort of like the direction of travel in terms of the different technologies and fuels that are gonna be required to meet net zero over the next 30 years. And those are very dependent on duty cycle, whether that be urban, regional or long haul. They cover a range of powertrain technologies and sustainable renewable liquid and gaseous fuels. But at the moment, the real challenge is that 90%, uh, 98%, I should say, of the commercial vehicle fleet is obviously uh, a diesel. Um, and that's obviously going to need to change quite significantly if we want to meet a net zero fleet. And there's going to be a variety of technologies and fuels. So, for example, have battery electric um, predominantly focusing at the moment um, in, in, in urban areas, um, plug in hybrid and range extender. We're also looking at um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, probably more towards um, the middle and the end of, the, uh, of, this, of this decade. And more for the long haul, we're looking at continuary and the continued use um, of renewable fuels um, as well. Manufacturers um, will be under pressure um, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 emissions from those vehicles um, with regulatory targets in 2025 and 2030, which will improve efficiency and encourage um, really the introduction of a range of new powertrains. But it's also worth highlighting that um, renewable fuels will also continue to play a long-term role. That will be conventional biofuels um, and blends of fuels into sort of biodiesel, B20, B100, and drop-in fuels um, such as HVO um, and synthetic fuels. We also have um, biomethane, which is used in, in gas vehicles for, for heavy duty vehicles. <clears throat> It's also worthwhile saying that our electricity system will continue to decarbonize. That needs to significantly uh, reduce in its carbon intensity. And we'll also see hydrogen as well, but it's important to highlight that hydrogen at the moment, 99% of that hydrogen in today's society is great, it's produced from fossil sources. So that will need to be low carbon. And there's various uh, technological routes to getting low carbon hydrogen as well. And that will put the supply chains of those will ramp up um, over the next 10 and 20 years. Um, but importantly, to accompany that energy and fuel transition, we're going to need infrastructure. And that's infrastructure for both battery electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell um, as well. And that's going to really take place on both depots and also we're going to need that public network as well. I think most fundamentally, from a fleet operator's perspective, um, there's going to be needing of robust evidence and confidence of the world to world greenhouse gas emission performance of all these technologies. Um, so you can make those decisions. You need to understand the operational performance and obviously the total cost of ownership as well is gonna be critically important at, this, at the moment in time. Some of these technologies are quite expensive, therefore policy interventions are required to make those um, more affordable. So just to focus then on um, the next decade, really, um, I've looked here at both sort of urban delivery, regional and long haul. 
Electric vans and small trucks gonna play um, a, an important role and potentially for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, in the van market, we've really seen a, a growth um, in electric um, vans, both plug-in hybrid, and um, um, pure battery electric um, from the likes of Vauxhall, Peugeot, Citroën um, and Mercedes. Um, Ford have made an announcement that from 2025 that their uh, commercial vehicles from the van sector will be available as plug-in hybrid and um, battery electric. We're beginning to see um, a, a small entry of models for, for um, hydrogen fuel cell as well. And one example of that is from Renault and they will probably serve as range extenders. We've obviously got plug-in van grants as well for small, um, large vans, and they range from three and a half thousand pounds all the way up to um, 6,000. And I think for the, for the large vans, there's probably about 18 models there that um, are um, suitable uh, for that funding stream. When it comes to region, a long haul, lot, lots more, more complicated, I would say, in a longer time frame in terms of transitioning to zero emission. And there's going to be a range of, um, of uh, vehicle um, technologies and fuels to decarbonize region and long haul. But in the near term, we'll probably see plug-in hybrid and hydrogen fuel cell vans, biomethane in compressed natural gas and, and, and LNG. They're probably now around about a thousand um, biomethane trucks and a growing number of public refueling station. We're going to see early um, electric, the electric trucks uh, and hydrogen fuel cell, for example, Hyundai um, are going to be bringing to the UK market a hydrogen fuel cell truck around about 2023. We're also going to see 44 tonne um, hydrogen, um, sorry, electric trucks from, from Volvo as well. But we mustn't forget we also have um, renewable fuels and there's going to be a continued role, role probably for dropping fuels like um, hydrated vegetable oil and synthetic fuels um, as well. So some of the incentives at the moment for, 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 the, for the truck market, we've got the, uh, the plug-in truck grant uh, for small trucks, that's about 20% of the purchase price at 16,000 and for larger truck that moves up to 25,000. There needs to be a minimum of a 60 mile um, zero emission range. There's also no regional policies that bring benefits in terms of total cost of ownership. We've got clean air zones in the ultra low emission zone where zero emission vehicles are exempt. And we've also got the congestion charge um, as well, but that will come to an end in terms of electric vehicles being exempt from 2025. In terms of the benefits, um, in terms of um, fuel duty, by methane and natural, ga uh, natural gas vehicles have a reduced rate and for hydrogen battery electric, um, it's zero. Zemo Partnership are supporting government in developing new guidelines and standards for future funding streams that are very much focused on the plug-in uh, truck grant. So we're working with industry and our stakeholders to, to look at those uh, new standards. Just to wrap up, I wanted to give you an overview of some of the work that Zemo Partnership is doing really to help government and operators in terms of providing robust evidence and guidelines in terms of encouraging the uptake of a range of different um, low carbon and zero emission fuels and technologies. So most recently we published our work in supporting the 32 um, million low emission freight and logistics trial um, that was supported by a range of private companies and by Innovate UK and Zemo who were the delivery partner. And that involved around about 130 vehicles um, being demonstrated and tested in terms of real world operational performance, greenhouse gas emissions and running costs. And there were a variety of different technologies, both for vans and trucks, battery electric, range extender vehicles, dual fuel hydrogen, uh, diesel and hydrogen, um, biomethane trucks. And the operators that were engaged in this program were the likes of John Lewis Partnership, um, Sainsbury's, um, uh, Waitrose as well, and Newt Cargo. And Really, this provides some really robust evidence of the, the performance of these vehicles and that all this information um, can be found on Zemo's website. 
We've also produced a renewable fuels guide uh, to give an overview of the range of sustainable biofuels um, from FAME to HVO to LPG to biomethane that are on the market, what are the operational costs, um, and some real world examples of case studies from commercial fleets and local authority fleets which are using these um, current sustainable fuels to decarbonise um, their transport operations. Finally, um, Zemo Partnership recently launched a renewable fuels assurance scheme. One of the barriers that we'd seen to the adoption of sustainable low carbon fuels was that operators wanted more evidence on the greenhouse gas performance and sustainability of high blend um, renewable fuels that can be predominantly used in, in the truck market. And those include um, biofuels and green hydrogen. And our scheme is really there to provide independent verification um, of those um, of both the life cycle greenhouse gas performance and um, sustainability um, in terms of um, auditing those supply chains right across from the collection of waste to buy uh, to manufacturing biofuels to blending and distribution to the to the end customer. This enables um, fleet operators to have accurate um, GHG emissions for company reporting, reporting and to base their decision making on. The scheme involves um, an independent auditor really um, checking um, renewable fuel supplies in terms of the claims they are making with regards to the renewable fuels they're selling. Once companies are approved, renewable fuel suppliers have to issue their customers with renewable fuel declarations. And there's one there on the right hand side. And as you can see, we've included a color coded banding, um, which really identifies very easily the greenhouse gas emission savings of that particular renewable fuel. So at the moment, um, we have a number of companies that I'm very pleased to say have been approved under the scheme, um, including um, CNG fuels for biomethane, Argent Energy for biodiesel, um, green biofuels uh, for HVO, and Air Liquid Gas Bus Alliance uh, and Green Energy. So we really hope that this, this scheme will help give confidence to the market in terms of adopting um, both um, biofuels and green hydrogen in the future. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gloria. Very interesting. Um, do remember you can keep asking questions uh, using the tab below. We've had a few now coming in for Gloria on that, so um, I look forward to hearing your answers on that in a minute. Our final speaker is uh, David Horsfall, uh, Director of Tysley Energy Park. I think this will be pretty interesting too. Hi, David. Morning. Um, so thank you very much um, for having me here today. It's great to be able to speak at this event on Clean Air Day and to follow Gloria and Council as far. So my name is David Horsfall and I'm director of Tysley Energy Park and I'm here um, speaking because at Tysley Energy Park we've built a first of a kind low and zero carbon publicly accessible refueling station. Today I want to talk specifically around the role of publicly accessible refueling infrastructure and how this can help local firms. The key messages that I'd like to get across today um, is the need for effective infrastructure along with a new approach which is centered around partnerships. The big challenges um, we feel that we are facing um, are that uh, we need to prioritize investment. Um, there are lots of different views at the moment. Technology is moving rapidly. Consumer habits are changing, requiring cheap goods and deliveries quicker than ever. Yet logistic companies are also faced with higher costs associated with emission targets. So over the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of our site under our, our area why Tysley Energy Park was chosen as part of a citywide study in Birmingham um, for refueling infrastructure and also regional plans to expand low and zero carbon refueling infrastructure. And then finally, just a, a bit of detail around what we built at Tysley Energy Park and what we hope to achieve over the coming years. So dealing with our site first, um, you have a um, picture here from the 1920s and um, this image is here because I wanted to illustrate when we um, moved our family business here in 1850, it was largely uh, because of infrastructure within the area. So in the top left hand side of the screen, you'll see um, a railway line. In the top right hand screen, there's the Coventry Road, which is now the A45. And the bottom right hand of the screen, there is the Grand Union Canal. Today, that infrastructure is just as important as it was then. So um, you have the A45 there in pink, which is a major road, 
linking to the M42 and then bypassing Coventry. In blue, you've got the Grand Union Canal, which links to London. It's the longest canal in England. Whilst, you know, back when we bought the site, it was about bringing coal in and shifting our materials out. Today, the, the biggest use for the canal is the um, towpath, which includes uh, intermediate pressure gas main, um, telecommunications and other key infrastructure for our project. And in yellow, you've got the Taizu Railway Station and um, the uh, a major refueling depot for, refuel for trains within Birmingham and um, also uh, a, a line linking Birmingham to Lambton Spa, Stratford Avon and, and also around the country. The, the reason I wanted to show rail here, and I'm not going to go into it in detail today, is that Taizu Energy Park also have a partnership with the University of Birmingham, who've co-developed a hydrogen train working with Porterbrook as a proof of concept. Um, so from a refueling infrastructure provider's point of view, um, base load and consistent use is key. So looking across transport sectors, which might include the rail industry is key, uh, we feel for this sort of refueling infrastructure um, being commercially viable in the future. This image here shows the 70 acre site in the context of East, um, East Birmingham. So you've got um, 250 businesses within our local area. Um, you've got an energy from waste plant in the bottom right hand side of the screen that has uh, 350 refuse collection vehicles coming there every day. Lots of plans around the regeneration of the area um, and major developments in the form of HS2, which is being brought forward through this area. Um, so you'll see uh, uh, as well as all of these businesses and um, development plans, you've also got a lot of energy infrastructure with the 25 megawatt plant beside us, a 10 megawatt biomass plant on our site and plans to build um, more generation facilities in this area. So just talking a little bit about this, um, the citywide studies around infrastructure I referred to earlier. So this is the blueprint for Birmingham that was published in 2015, which was essentially a mapping study looking at refu um, refueling infrastructure, which was to be deployed across Birmingham, uh, focusing around key priorities and opportunities. So at the time when this was published, the Birmingham City Council was saying, we wanna be a leading green city um, and the uptake of alternative fuels um, is essential to meet emission targets. And the, the provision of this refueling infrastructure is key to meet these um, objectives. Um, 10 districts were looked at, um, infrastructure demand and zones for deployment were kind of key areas within the study. Um, and the top right table shows the, the need for lots of infrastructure that was identified, including hundreds of, hundreds of charge, charges, as well as um, 10 to 20 public accessible sites like Taizy Energy Park. So Taizy Energy Park was specifically identified because uh, we've got this um, back to base uh, waste um, uh, um, depot next to us. Um, with the convergence of lots of RCV, you've got direct access off the A45, um, lots of renewable power produced on site, this intermediate pressure gas main on our boundary, as well as a bus network within the area. Um, these are the recommendations that came from the study, which I'm not going to list, but it's sort of the, the key headlines for us are that back to base fleets from public and private sector are key to underpinning refueling facilities like this. Um, anything we can learn from these and early adopters are going to be key to give confidence to others. Um, conversations with planners, logistic operators, private landlords like ourselves, and bodies like Highway England and council estates departments are going to be key going forward to identify more of these sites and to optimize delivery. Um, and also the integration of energy and waste strategies will be key going forward as well. And what with COP26 coming forward, um, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow um, in 2021, this is a huge opportunity for Birmingham and the West Midlands to, to put ourselves on the map. Um, and then last but not least, um, you know, continued dialogue with uh, OMEs and specialist maintenance providers, industry and SMEs, um, are, are key to the transition. So we wholeheartedly support the recommendations. So this month, um, from, from a regional context, um, a, a lot of um, press has been around other studies that are underway. So this has come from Midlands Engine, for example, um, and Midlands Connect have pr produced this report, which um, talks about uh, plans to develop um, low zero carbon refueling infrastructure in the region. Uh, and Midlands Connect say that they're looking at future scenarios of alternative fuel take up and long term policies and action plans to increase adoption. Um, so they're saying the region needs somewhere in the region of 800 million. 
um, which is being asked for from central government. They're talking about 65 hydrogen refueling stations, 22 compressed natural gas refueling facilities in 26 locations, all of which are being reviewed. So there's going to be a massive effort into um, engaging with um, freight and logistic companies, developing working groups, supporting trials and capacity mapping. So I feel that there, there's a real head of steam developing around this agenda. So just focusing on um, our facility at Taizy Energy Park and to give you a feel for the process we've been through. Uh, so really over the last um, uh, seven or eight years, there's been a, a kind of big effort on the delivery of um, our low and zero carbon refueling station, which started back in 2014 when we were having focus groups looking at the concept and how you develop a facility like this. By 2015, we, we'd identified five partners who are developing these outline plans. By 2016, we were submitting a detailed planning application. 2018, we were focusing on the funding, discharge of conditions, working drawings, and going through the procurement process. 2018, we were building the facility. 2019, we had the modular fueling op um, facility up and running. And between 2019 and today, um, then the hydrogen refueling station has been built. So next year it will be around the commercial um, charging facility becoming operational and the year after that the compressed natural gas refueling uh, element. So, so far we've spent 1.5 million of our own money. We received 1.5 million from the Greater Birmingham Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, and hopefully people will see that what we've got here is a de-risked place where they can come and deliver projects and collaborate with like-minded people. So. Um, a bit more about what the low and zero carbon refueling station does. So it's an unmanned refueling facility that's 24 seven pay at pump, um, which will accept credit cards, debit cards, um, fuel payment cards. Um, the reason why you want to put compressed natural gas and hydrogen in, in a place like this rather than in depot is it's very expensive to put the kit in um, and it makes sense to put them in centralized locations where lots of people can benefit and learn. Um, EV, um, Charging can also happen from a renewable, sustainable um, supply, which is produced on site. Um, companies can also benefit from trialing and demonstrating on so site, which is now supported by a £20 million um, Birmingham Energy Innovation Centre that the University of Birmingham have just built um, next to this refueling station. Um, and also in time, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to um, develop opportunities for businesses to jointly procure fleets. This is an aerial shot of the site and in orange on the left hand side you can see a, a commercial um, a vehicle wash for HGVs and double deck buses. You've got um, in the middle of the site Certus Energy's modular refueling facility for HGV operators which provide diesel gas oil add blue and drop in alternatives which you know, as you heard about earlier your synthetic HVOs, GTLs, high blend diesels and um, so that those conversations with Certus Energy um, should be happening and, and you, you should contact them if, if um, you haven't already done so and you're interested in um, uh, drop-in alternatives and liquid fuels. Um, in green you've got um, the compressed natural gas refueling facility which operates by connecting to the natural gas uh, pipeline and um, compressing gas using on-site compressors and then dis dispensing them to HGVs and vans and that's bio CNG that, that we're talking about in the next couple of years. Um, and then pink there, the locations for the commercial scale charges supplied from the on-site power plant. And then in blue, um, you've got the hydrogen, which um, the car refueler is now fully operational. Bus refueler will be in the next couple of months and then tube trailer dispensing by the autumn of this year. It's a three megawatt proton exchange, elect uh, proton exchange uh, uh, membrane electrolyzer, which is the greenest hydrogen you can get for transport fuel. Um, it's the biggest one in the UK at present, and um, as Councillor Zaffer spoke about earlier, 20 hydrogen buses that Council have um, purchased will be refueling from there um, over the coming months. This is just to give you a bit of a view for what, what the energy park will look like in the future. Um, it gives you a feel for hopefully how the low and zero carbon transport fuels will be linked to this energy system. So all of the energy infrastructure on the right hand side and then the um, low and zero carbon refueling station to the left with a Birmingham Energy Innovation Centre, the black box in the middle there. So um, just to, to wrap things up, so success for us 
um, is well having built this this refueling station that's a huge step forward and I think um, you know it's going to be 10 years to, to get to where you know fully developed um, with 10 million pounds worth of investment um, we now need to start developing strong baseload demand and long-term contracts we're probably around 30% capacity, we want to get to 100% utilization, at which point we'll have confidence to build more of these. We want to hear from anyone in the audience about what success looks like for your companies. Um, um, we want to hear about your needs and, and TEP wants to help companies transition to alternative fuels. And hopefully we can share the risks along the way. We've got some really exciting projects in the pipeline over the coming months. We'll be able to share information about large scale field trials that we've recently won funding for. We believe these are really going to accelerate the transition to low and zero carbon fuels in the near future. Um, now more than ever, we need to keep building relationships with fleet operators, industry, SMEs, OEMs. We've got to break this vicious cycle around lack of refueling infrastructure resulting in limited vehicle take up and vice versa. Uh, we need to build a lot of publicly accessible refueling stations um, for low and zero carbon fuels. And the key to this is integrated thinking and um, working um, jointly together. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, David. Um, if we can invite uh, Gloria and now Sylvia back to answer some uh, questions on behalf of Councillor uh, Zaffer, who's not available anymore. Is he doing clean air day? Um, we've had a few questions come in. We've always got uh, time for a, a few more if you want to put them to, uh, to the panel. Uh, we'll start off with a question um, to, this is during Gloria's, uh, sorry, wait a second, turn my video back on, there we go. Not that you need to see me, I'm not the interesting one. <laughs> um, this is during uh, Gloria's presentation, asking about uh, how the freight trial participants will be determined. Well, the, the, the left program has already been completed. So the, the, all the participants, um, I believe, were, um, had to uh, enter a um, interest in participating in that trial and they were assessed accordingly. But that trial has now been finished. And as I said, the, uh, the results are available on our website. Um, as for the next trial that's going to be taking place, and um, that has yet to be determined, as I mentioned before, the um, um, the 10 point plan mentioned the next um, large scale freight trial looking at zero emission technologies that has yet to be um, outlined in terms of what the criteria will be or the participants. So uh, watch this space for that one. Um, a question for the councillor. Uh, this was uh, in relation to uh, electric and hydrogen refueling points. Uh, what will there be any commitments for biofuels in the city? Um, absolutely, there, there will be. And this is, um, as, as David Horsfall pointed out, this is a collaboration with the private sector. So um, Tizi Energy Park is the first of those collaborations. It, it's, it has been a blueprint. And as you mentioned, we kicked off in 2015 uh, with the uh, Birmingham blueprint to start to understand what uh, commercial fleet requirements would, would be and what that would look like for uh, refuelling and where that refuelling would be. So. Um, from the success of, of uh, Tysley Energy Park, we are starting to look, and obviously we have strategic partners with Transport for West Midlands, the Combined Authority, um, and organisations uh, such as Midlands uh, Connect in identifying those sites. So absolutely, that, that is um, rolling out that low and uh, zero emission carbon infrastructure is critical. And what we recognise is that, and as, as Gloria was showing, is that, you know, there, there is um, a timeline for when zero emission with those those vehicles, particularly heavy vehicles, are actually on the market. And it's about absolutely addressing the interim, which is low carbon uh, fuel. So biofuels, uh, biomethane, you know, in terms of CNG and uh, LNG, you know, are part of that. Uh, on, on that um, very similar vein, a uh, question for David about... <laughs> Um, LNG facilities uh, at Tisley, there's uh, many people asking about options and why that's not been included. Uh, it's a good question. So we can put LNG on Tisley Energy Park, but the feeling at the time when we were co-designing this was your LNG will, will typically um, support a certain market around long haul and 
is that the right market for us? Will we be bringing transport into central Birmingham? Because essentially we're two miles away from the city centre. Are we going to be bringing vehicles in that wouldn't otherwise be coming to the city? So the feeling was at the time that LNG should probably be close to the highway networks. And um, yeah, we, we should be making sure that you're, you're not bringing um, vehicles into the city that don't need to be there. But, but that we've, we purposely allocated a large site so you can put infrastructure like that in if there was an you know, overwhelming demand for it. Fair enough. Um, this is a, probably a question for Gloria, as it was mentioned during her presentation. Um, this is in relation to the, the grants that are available. So are there currently, are there any plans for uh, including vehicles over 12 tonnes? Because that's the current bracket for um, the grant is between three and a half and 12 tonnes, isn't it? That's been outlined on the government website. Um, I know that there are, are vehicles above that available, but um, do you know if they're going to be included? Um, yes, there are plans. I mean, I can't give an exact date yet of when they will be released, but they're certainly um, on the card. So I'd say uh, watch this space. Zemo is uh, also involved in sort of trying to um, really look at the standards and guidelines for those um, plug-in um, truck grants as well. So hopefully um, soon. And on the same um, question of money, uh, incentives for biofuel purposes, somebody's asking here. Interestingly, yeah, it's, a, it's an area that I work with very closely. Unfortunately, um, there are no demand side um, incentives for um, liquid renewable fuels. Obviously, you've got fuel duty uh, benefits for, for biomethane, but unfortunately, there isn't. Um, Zemo Partnership um, are trying to do some work to sort of try to change that landscape and provide um, evidence to government of why that um, incentive uh, mechanism needs to change. That needs to improve because we see it as a critically um, important area to encourage uptake. And on the subject of um, electricity and gross vehicle weights, I know in vans they've increased as a, um, an allowance for uh, the batteries. Uh, somebody's asking, will there be similar for, for um, heavy trucks? So 44 tonnes or 40 tonne in Europe, um, electric vehicles, will they have a, an allowance? Um, I don't think there's necessarily going to be a derogation uh, for heavier vehicles for like battery electric and hydrogen fuel. So I believe that you can have an extra one tonne in, in weight. It's more the lower um, uh, vehicle categories and their weights that have to have that increase. So at the moment, there's going to be no changes because that additional weight can be accounted for just as long as it's up to a tonne. There are a lot more weight critical small yeah. vehicles, aren't they, obviously? And um, perhaps the road network wouldn't be able to take um, increases everywhere for over 44 tonnes, but that's a different different subject altogether. Um, here's, a, here's a question. Will the hydrogen at Tysley be green, blue or grey? I don't even understand what that means, but <laughs> perhaps David, you can answer that one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it all depends on how the hydrogen's produced. So um, in the presentation, I talked about the hydrogen being made by ITM power from um, electrolysis. So that's the greenest hydrogen you're gonna get. Um, so uh, you're essentially using renewable electricity and um, the electrolysis process converts that into a green hydrogen. So you're, you're um, blue and gray from an industrial process, which uh, you know, maybe there's an element of carbon capture within it. Um, but yeah, the, the greenest, the greenest hydrogen you can get. Fair enough. A question of terminology, which is leads me nicely to my next question, which is uh, for uh, the councillor for Sylvia. Uh, are there any targets for Birmingham uh, based on carbon neutral or net zero? There seem to be a mix of language used. As we all know, they are not the same. Okay. So talking um, about net zero, yes, there is, there is a target, as the, the councillor mentioned, that the, the council committed in 2019 to be uh, net zero um, by, by 2030 um, or as near to that. And it's recognised that that is an absolutely huge task and it's in the context of the government's target of, of 2050. But by, by talking um, and pushing for 2030, it's very much that, that it's mobilising the council um, and the council has set up um, a huge initiative called Route to Zero um, about not only looking about what the council can do and what the council can lead on in terms of uh, its own service delivery and its stock, whether that's about um, the decarbonisation of, of heat and power, um, but also as a council, what, what we're doing in terms of decarbonising transport and enabling that to happen, which is the, the, the councillor um, actually uh, mentioned. Thank you. Um, we are at the end of the, the questions that we found. We'll be moving on uh, soon to the, the next section of our um, 
webinar on operating factors. Um, so if anybody has got one last question, please do get it in because I've just got a quick question, um, probably directed to David, but I think everybody could answer it really. Um, David, you mentioned about 800 million pounds um, for alternative fuel network. Is that enough? I mean, I'm pretty sure your, <laughs> your site costs a lot and 800 million spread around doesn't sound like it's going to go that far. Yeah, I, I, that, that's a fair comment. But you, you also got to remember that, I mean, we've, we've been through the most painful process because um, th th there, was, there wasn't anything to, to um, learn from. So everything was torturous when it came to going through legal processes, going through planning processes, you know, get, getting all your environmental consents. And, and also just the, the operators are understanding how they work on a site like ours. So our learning curve has been huge. So that 10 million sh should be sort of dropping incrementally on with every one you build. Um, so I I'd like to think that 800 million would go a long way, but it, I, I think with the costs I'm talking about today are really are the first one is going to be the tricky one. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of learning and streamlining. And, and um, I, I think that we just got to get on with it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, always painful going first, isn't it? I suppose. Good. Um, unless anybody has anything else they would like to add, I will draw this Q&A to a close. So thank you very much, um, everybody. And uh, thank you for very interesting presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, we're going to move on to session two, uh, which is the operating factors. Our first speaker is the very knowledgeable John Comer, uh, product manager at Volvo Trucks. John, over to you. Emily there is John still muted at the moment if you are trying to talk to us yeah it always helps to change that yeah hopefully you can see my screen good morning everyone we uh, can't yeah. yet see your screen John but we're we can see you all right there we go okay and he's on slide yeah you can see see the, see the slideshow there that's fine. Uh, good morning, camera. everyone. Uh, John Comer from uh, Volvo Trucks. I um, want to talk about the goods and services that we uh, deliver from A to B, as uh, uh, Gloria and, and David have picked up on, on already. Um, the demands, obviously, to deliver from A to B, obviously, have grown in recent times due to current situations. Um, we deliver goods A to B every day, um, and uh, we have a high expectation from society on uh, delivery of goods from A to B. So maybe, uh, you know, to save carbon going forward, we might need to timetable goods. But as well as looking at that, we'll take a, a quick run through how Volvo see the, the future fuel roadmap, and we're going on a journey from uh, D to F. Um, with regards to clean air day, obviously a key element of any clean air zone is air quality. And uh, over the, the last uh, 30 years, we've made massive improvements in, in air quality. Uh, again, if we look at the outline of particular mat matter between particulates and NOx at Euro 1, we've kind of got the area that could be St Andrews, Villa Park or the Hawthorns uh, as, a, as a reference point in terms of a playing surface. And then at Euro 2, we saw a significant drop with regards to, to soot. So PM uh, got a, a massive drop. And then we went to Euro 3 in 2000. Um, you can see now we're taking uh, significant strides with regards to uh, NOx reduction. And then Euro 4, we introduced after treatment for the first time on heavy vehicles. Uh, and again, a, a significant drop in particulates. Uh, and again, the NOx journey uh, going on on its way because the, the first uh, low emission zone uh, in the UK uh, sort of in 2008 was all driven uh, by particulate matter. Today, it's both uh, particulates and NOx. And finally, we, we go to Euro 5, and then Euro 5 to Euro 6. So again, everybody has a view about the diesel engine, but the diesel engine today is very, very clean. And you can see that here. Euro 6 meant a 50% reduction in uh, particulate matter and an 80% reduction in NOx. So we've gone from the football playing surfaces of Birmingham down to the Edgbaston cricket crease in, in terms of area. Uh, our focus now, as uh, Gloria's already touched on, is uh, the drive towards uh, decarbonisation, and, and there are benefits here with regards to air quality as well. We are mandated through uh, VECTO, the Vehicle Energy Consumption Calculation Tool, 
uh, to offer a 15% reduction uh, by 2025 and a 30% reduction by 2030. And these are very, very tough targets. And uh, as we lay out there, as Volvo trucks, uh, oh, as we, uh, as we leave the EU, the Vecto targets haven't disappeared. They are now being uh, uh, drawn into the a UK Vecto regulation as laid out there. And of course, as uh, Gloria sp spoke this morning, we also have the net carbon targets of the UK government. Uh, as Volvo trucks, we are looking to uh, uh, take a tighter uh, drive or uh, aim higher and look for a 50% reduction by 2030. We're already on that way. Uh, I mentioned Vecto. Today, when you specify your truck, you can have a, a Vecto calculation tool. Uh, it's measured in grams, ton kilometers. Uh, so it takes into account the weight of the vehicle. And typically, a couple of years ago on a heavy tractor, we would have had a, a 66.2 rating. And again, by making small changes, uh, not just to, to the engine, we can uh, improve this significantly. Airflow packages gives us a great reduction. Uh, that's one of the biggest uh, forces on the vehicle. The other big force on the vehicle is rolling resistance. And again, a change in uh, uh, energy rating of tyre has a, a massive impact uh, for minimal cost when you buy the truck brand new. We also have intelligent drive lines now, and we have a fuel package including uh, what we call predictive cruise control. And we're seeing a massive take up on that, around about 70% of our, our vehicles uh, take the predictive cruise control to support the driver and optimize the drive line across the, the topography of the route. And uh, the other one is uh, diesel is not dead. We are, we are now uh, looking at um, uh, developing further diesel technology from the 500 horsepower to the 460, what we call iSave, where we have uh, the same or even a higher level of peak torque, uh, but a huge benefit with regards to fuel consumption. So that's available today. When you specify your truck, ask for the Vecto, uh, the Vecto score. And uh, again, in, the, in our targets, even by optimizing the spec, we can look at an 18.9% reduction in CO2. And the good thing about that green uh, uh, saving is it's great for your pocket as well, the bottom line. Uh, every uh, litre of fuel saved, uh, uh, every litre of fuel saved uh, reduces 2.63 kilograms of, of CO2. Uh, as a vehicle manufacturer, um, yeah, we, uh, to support David's um, new features or new, uh, new site, uh, yeah, it's interesting, not, so, not one size will fit all because of the energy demands from the vehicle. So as Gloria highlighted, we've seen last mile uh, vans with regards to the take up. We're obviously looking at utilization. So we're now able to offer 26 ton city truck, which would in effect take 11 vans off the road. Uh, obviously, if we can get that level of a service agreed with the customer, does every customer need something ordered yesterday to arrive first thing uh, this morning? So a 26 ton electric city truck, uh, given the space could take 11 vans off the road within the city. And then serving the city, serving Birmingham through its uh, major motorway network, uh, we've got the, the heavy trucks and we've got diesel, we've got liquid natural gas, uh, we've got HVO, which is the, uh, the drop in alternative fuels. And then we can look at bio. Uh, we're now in the position next year to offer electric and going forward, we'll look at hydrogen. The other one is thinking outside of the box. It's not just about the vehicle, it's about the, uh, the uh, utilization of that vehicle. Uh, like our 26 ton city vehicle, we could provide a truck uh, that maybe at night time drives to the pallet centers with two trailers on. So a longer, heavier vehicle, which is very common in uh, Scandinavia, uh, fully fueled would give an instant 27% reduction in CO2. So uh, yeah, it's not just the technology. Diesel's not dead. Uh, Mr. Diesel is the most famous engineer uh, he's a household name, but obviously Mr. Tesla uh, is, is chasing him on that title. But diesel is being developed. We're uh, looking at kinetic energy recovery on the vehicle. So we're using the turbine exhaust gases to drive directly to, to the crank. We're looking at the thermodynamics of the engine. So we've got uh, a wave share piston head. 
you know, as I said earlier, the, the diesel energy is the most efficient uh, unit to convert uh, for high loads, but it's also very efficient in terms of energy density. You can get the fuel uh, on the vehicle. And that's one of the issues as we look at alternative fuels, we may have to look at the weights and dimensions of trucks in order to get that energy on board. Um, we uh, are working with the fuel consumption and uh, uh, Mr. Barrow's magazine, Commercial Motor, we recently uh, broke the uh, record, being the first truck manufacturer to get through 9 MPG on their very tough route. Not only did we break it, we achieved 9.49 MPG with this technology. And, uh, you know, the, the, the demand for this truck is, 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 is high because every 0.1 saving of, um, in terms of fuel consumption, in terms of MPG, means uh, £700 in the pocket every year for every truck. Drop-in alternative fuels, it's great to see that HVO is available. HVO, you, if you went HVO, you're, you're decarbonizing tomorrow. It's a drop-in fuel. All our engines at Euro 6 are certified uh, for, for HVO. So uh, you can go up uh, and, and up, up to the Tizy Business Park today, fill up with HVO, and there'll be no issues with the vehicle. Uh, and uh, you've, you've already uh, become carbon uh, neutral. Um, we've got diesel uh, and now we're going to electric, D2E. So uh, today commercially we have uh, two uh, key electric trucks available, a 16 tonne city vehicle and a 26 tonne uh, rigid as already outlined. And you can see a line up here. The vehicle in, in the middle is a refuse vehicle, that's not the battery. So um, the, the vehicles are, are ready and are able to, to be ordered. But it's a different way of working. Today we work at, look at fuel consumption and we measure the energy after the event. Going forward, we've got to look at the program and where that vehicle is going uh, prior to the event. So working with uh, electric is different to diesel. We need initial meetings to set up expectation and obviously present the product offer. We uh, need to ensure suitability with the bodybuilder. There's health and safety issues to be considered with 600 volt systems. And uh, we need to train bodybuilders to work on these vehicles. We also need to train the technicians uh, that support these vehicles. And we're blessed in the fact that we also uh, build buses and most of our, our key uh, bus dealers are able to support 600 volt system uh, uh, easily. Our dealer in Birmingham has uh, the capability to look after the uh, the full electric bus fleet because they look after the electric network uh, within Harrogate. So we have um, to do all the weight calculations. I said the geometry of the truck uh, changes. So we need to consider the payload, how that payload goes on and off. What other energy demands are there on the vehicle? So we do a, an electric road simulation, which is outlined here. And not only do we do that electric road simulation in year one, we have to do it in year two because unlike a diesel, um, uh, electric vehicle gets less efficient or it, its range reduces as the battery wears out, whereas a diesel engine wears in. So we need to conduct a full range analysis for the feasibility of the operation. We uh, are welcome to have space around the city because we need a, a location and space and we also need the electric infrastructure on board. We need to, as was discussed by Gloria there, we need to look at the elig eligibility for an o OZEV grant uh, and again, we need to look at the limitations on that. Obviously, the range is a given. I mean, we, we, uh, the range has to be a given. We do that when we do the, the analysis because the key word about these type of vehicles is the commercial. They are commercial vehicles. If they don't do what they were, were meant to deliver, then that's, we have a huge issue. The other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure we don't over-specify them with regards to range because every battery currently weighs around 520 kilos. And then obviously the commercial offer and aftermarket support from an accredited uh, Volvo dealer. So again, we, we have dealers, uh, we have a, a huge uh, uh, resource in terms of technician capability today due to the bus uh, structure, but we also have to make sure that the dealer is able to support that demand. And the nice thing about these type of vehicles is uh, they will be close to the city center. So your home dealer uh, will be very, very supportive in, in that aim. We're moving to the next step. We're going to heavy duty and we will have these trucks in production from the end of uh, next year. Uh, they will be uh, uh, 
two or three motor trucks. They will still have a conventional gearbox uh, to cope with the additional weights. Um, and they will have full air suspension and they uh, will be offered with low cabs to meet the requirements of other cities with regards to direct vision. We'll also have tractor units, but we'll also have rigids for city construction available as well. And the energy demand is from five, 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 450 to 540 kilowatt hours, and it's up to 300 uh, kilometers in terms of range. Uh, incentives were mentioned with regards to uh, weights. Unfortunately, uh, uh, there are no incentives. There are incentives for the gross vehicle weight. There are no incentives for the towing weight. So a 40 ton truck, we will have to consider the weight of the batteries in terms of the operation. And we will also have uh, six per two trucks, but there'll be slightly different six per two trucks in order to get the battery uh, and energy on board. And then of course we have the added, added incentive that there is no, no UK uh, road fund license there. So every incentive uh, we need to look for to drive this change. In the rigid market, again, you can see the whole range of cabs there from city cabs to medium cabs, to construction cabs and even long haul. Yes, we do have the benefit today. In Europe, it's up to two tonne, uh, but in the UK, currently it's one tonne for two axle vehicles, uh, one tonne for three axle vehicles, but the key area where we do need it for construction vehicles is where they do get paid on payload. Uh, there is uh, no incentive. And if you look at the construction um, pictogram, it's not the same eight by four that you had before. It's a tried M design, with regards to a single front axle and three at the rear. And this is due to the packaging. The packaging is, is very dense. You know, you think I'm gonna take the engine away, I'll have uh, lots of space, but the engine uh, is now, engine space is now where the ancillaries go because the sides of the chassis are taken up uh, with, the, um, with the batteries. So uh, 90, uh, 90 kilowatt hour batteries uh, fitted on the side. So uh, there we have, have the vehicle. So that's where we are now. Um, in terms of timeline, we're shifting. We, we're shifting from internal combustion engines. So we're, we're, we're now moving from E to F. And F can be fuel cell, but F for us is also fossil free because again, given the mass and the dimensions of the vehicle that we're looking at, um, it's not just about the technology on the truck. It's where the fuel came from. So by 2040, we'll be fossil free and this fossil will probably be retired by then. So you can see the, the plan there. Battery electric take up first, around about 2025, fuel cell electric, and we're working on joint developments uh, uh, there with other manufacturers. But uh, where you get the fuel from is also crucial. Yeah, and so I'd like to finish with G, and uh, the, the uh, low emission freight trial was, was mentioned earlier. We have had tremendous success uh, with the uh, LNG. Oh, we have over 900 built or, or an order in the UK. In the low emission freight trial dedicated to gas report, we actually got a 13% saving of greenhouse gases at the tailpipe. We use the diesel cycle because it is the most efficient. It is a unique cycle to us. Uh, and we are, we are working with customers to get the fuel benefit of the incentive uh, of gas versus diesel until 2032. As David said, it's primarily aimed at long haul, 120,000 kilometers. Uh, you will be looking for a payback within three years. So I'd just like to finally close uh, with that key point uh, as we look at the road ahead. It's vehicle technology and fuel. Uh, and as we'll probably hear further, uh, it's also how we use the vehicle going forward uh, to get the best utilization to minimize the environmental uh, damage. So we're, we're part of the problem, uh, but we also need to be part of the solution. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, John. Really interesting. Um, love the visualization of the uh, football pitches down to cricket crease. Uh, very, very good. Um, everybody, uh, please do submit your questions on the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, John, you'll be pleased to know you didn't have any questions really there, so they must all completely understand the Volvo products. Uh, that's great news. <laughs> that's great news. <laughs> um, but I I can't believe for one minute that there won't be more questions to come. So do put some more in on the Q&A tab at the bottom. Right, our next speaker is Colin Smith, uh, Programme Manager for the Energy Saving Trust. Are you there, Colin? Yep, I'm here, no problem. I'll start Hello. sharing.
Okay, I'm hoping that's there. Everyone can see it. Okay, so yeah, Colin Smith, uh, Program Manager for Freight and Clean Vehicle at the Energy Saving Trust. And really what I'm going to give a little bit of a peek, a sneak peek at the revamped uh, freight portal, which in essence is a, an information hub to help road freight operators uh, reduce emissions, reduce costs, et cetera. Um, we have actually uh, launched this as a soft launch, so it is live. So you can go to the freightportal.org and see what it looks like. This is the, um, uh, the landing page. And uh, yeah, in essence, what we're trying to do is give information to operators to help freight, freight operators reduce emissions and costs. So in essence, the, the freight portal was initially launched back in 2018, and it was decided that we wanted to refresh, uh, get a little bit more information in there, just have a little bit more user-friendly um, uh, functionality. Um, it's funded and supported by the Department for Transport. Uh, it's hosted and delivered by the Energy Saving Trust um, in collaboration with the Zemo Partnership. Um, obviously, there's a need to raise the profile of freight transport decarbonisation to, to operators, and we're hoping we're addressing this uh, with the objective to support the, the operators uh, or the industry's commitment to uh, this 15% reduction in, uh, in uh, CO2 uh, from uh, nine, uh, 2015 levels to 2025. Um, obviously, uh, we're helping uh, getting it promoted by the trade body, so Logistics UK, the Road Haulage Association, Institute of uh, Logistics and Transport, and the SMMT. Obviously, when you have a new new portal, new new thing going, we have a new freight uh, portal brand, so that's the brand, and these are the, sort of the marketing pictures, so improving your fleet, helping you operate your fleet safely and sustainability. So you'll be looking out for these kinds of uh, images uh, as we prepare for the hard launch in a few weeks time. So what's on the, on the portal? In essence, there's uh, information on actions that you can take uh, easily to help reduce your emissions and cost. Uh, there's links to, uh, to guides. Uh, we have a case, a set of case studies, obviously aspiration to have a, a varied and extensive range of relevant case studies that demonstrates the benefits of taking action be that you know, reducing costs, reducing uh, fuel use, reducing um, emissions. So uh, a call out here is that if you have a good story to tell, then please get in touch and we'll be happy to uh, sort out a case study and get you on the, uh, on the, on the, on the portal so that you can uh, spread the word of, what, of the good stuff. Um, it's probably better for uh, our peers of operators to say, yeah, I've done this and it, it worked, rather than the, uh, other people saying, you should do this. So that's, the, that's kind of the case study aspect. Uh, we've also got uh, links to the, the fleet support schemes that are out there. So there's quite an abundance of uh, schemes with FOURS, et cetera, uh, EcoStars. Uh, so there's links to that on how you can have a look at those schemes and, and see if they're, they're fit for you. And um, uh, yeah, get some further information and stuff. In terms of, uh, we have the ability to register for updates. So if, uh, obviously this is gonna be a continually changing, uh, evolving information hub as, as things change. And as John has uh, previously mentioned, things are changing and they could be changing quite rapidly. So uh, this will be an evolving uh, portal that will help uh, um, operators understand what's, what's, uh, what's ahead. Um, something new is the, what we're calling the fuel cost cutter. And it really gives, it's a, it's a tool to indicate potential savings and emission reductions associated with uh, quick win actions. Um, so and I'll, I'll have got another slide on that just to go through that. Um, and then obviously we have the ability to submit feedback. So we're actively encouraging uh, operators, uh, any, anyone involved in uh, road freight to to submit some uh, feedback, what, what's good, what's bad, what's uh, needed, what's uh, missing, etc. So that's uh, uh, hopefully interactive uh, aspect to the portal. In terms of the uh, fuel cost cutter, um, we've uh, got a fairly simple tool and it's pretty immediate. So you enter some uh, fairly 
basic data about your vehicle and your annual annual miles and where you're driving. Uh, you can pick an intervention. So some of these interventions like driver behavior, uh, tire optimization, route optimization, telematic stuff, and aerodynamics. And you pick those and you come up with a, you know, an immediate uh, estimate of fuel cost savings, emission reduction. So hopefully it gives you a, a flavor of, uh, well, if I did this, this is what could happen. Um, the, what's sitting behind this is obviously we have the Center for Sustainable Road Freight uh, Fleet Optimizer, which is quite an academic and quite a, uh, uh, an intense sort of uh, tool to use. Uh, and we just wanted to give a little bit of a flavor, a quick uh, estimator, ready reckoner to say, if I did this, what would be the outcome? So feel free to put in your data and uh, uh, see, what, see what you can say. In terms of the, the relaunch, we're planning it for uh, later in, in the, this month, uh, 30th of June, uh, 1st of July, in line with the ITT hub. Uh, I'm hoping that that still goes ahead, but uh, in essence, that's where we're trying to obviously give it a bit of a push. Uh, Department for Transport will be promoting the freight portal through uh, the likes of the DVSA, posters, test centers, etc. And um, we're asking obviously the trade bodies to help promote it through their membership. And we obviously actively encourage feedback. Um, Energy Saving Trust and Zemo partnership will provide, uh, uh, will promote it via their media channels. So it, there'll be a big push to try and get this, but it's not a case that it will just be one push. I think we're going to be going over a number of uh, months and possibly years to say that this is going to be the information hub that uh, Department for Transport will be looking at to help um, operators uh, start on their road to decarbonisation. Obviously, the uh, decarbonisation, uh, uh, let's say transport decarbonisation plan is is imminent, and there'll be lots of uh, policies and uh, actions in that, and this will be part of that to get the the um, the messages out there. Uh, we, we see this not as a, an EST website or a Zemo website or Department for Transport. It's, it's, it's there to help operators. So we see it as an operator's uh, website. So, yeah, actively encourage feedback, actively encourage people who might have case studies uh, and get, uh, get it useful for the, for the industry because it's, it's going to be a challenge meeting those uh, decarbonisation budgets and, and plans it's going to be quite a challenge uh, with various uh, technologies and, and operational uh, situations to, to challenge it uh, so hopefully this will this will help um, thanks for your attention that's the freight portal you can you can have a look at it now it's live now but obviously there'll be a, a launch going forward okay thank you very much Colin um, our next speaker is Catherine Bowen, uh, Senior Policy Advisor from the BBRLA. Hello, mm -hmm. Catherine. Good morning, everybody. Let me just share my screen. If you can just let me know that you can see that. Okay, if I go to the beginning, it'll help. Okay. There we are. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Catherine Bowen, Senior Policy Advisor at the British Vehicle Rental and Leasing Association, and I lead on our air quality, future mobility and decarbonisation work streams. I'm going to talk this morning about the role of rental and leasing to decarbonise uh, vehicles. So just to tell you a little bit about the BBRLA, <clears throat> we uh, are a trade association. Uh, last year, we had about 974 members. I think that's uh, up on last year. But we represent the demand side of the automotive industry. Our members own and operate 4 million cars, vans and trucks that operate on the UK roads. So that's one in 10 cars, one in six vans and one in five trucks will be owned and or operated by a BBRLA member. And our members are from leasing, rental, car club subscription and also offer fleet management. Our members are responsible for 50% of all new vehicles that are registered in the UK per annum. And by 2025, our members will be responsible for 80% of all battery electric vehicles that are registered in the UK. So our members recognize they have a really important role um, to play and are committed to supporting people on their decarbonization journey. Um, as we look at the mass uptake of zero emission transport. 
So looking a little bit further about this critical role, uh, our members run the youngest and cleanest fleet on the roads and provide people with businesses with flexible and affordable access to road transport from anything from the minute to the hour, days into weeks and then months and years. So the average rental or car club vehicle is kept for about a year and the average lease vehicle is about three or four years old. So it also means that we can put affordable vehicles onto the second hand market. So I think it's about one in five vehicles on the second hand market will come from a BVRLA member. And our members also have a critical role to play in advising their customers about how they can best decarbonize or how they can embrace more uh, sustainable transport modes for their travel needs. So we've developed a number of resources to support our members, but also their customers and the general consumer on clean air zones as we start to see the introduction. So on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that we have a clean air zone map. So the areas in green uh, depict the areas where we know CAS is and the ULES has gone live. So we have the Yon uh, London Ultra Low Emission Zone, which went live a couple of years ago. And then we obviously saw Bath and Birmingham go live um, Bath uh, in March and Birmingham on the 1st of June. You can also click into any of those areas and it will give you further information about what they're proposing in terms of charging, the size of the zone, et cetera, the type of clean air zone that it's gonna be and who's gonna be charged, whether it's private vehicles, commercial vehicles, et cetera. And then we also have a timeline um, that we've put to aid people to see when the clean air zones have or are due to go live. So as I mentioned, Bath, Birmingham, London are all live. We know that there are a number of other towns and cities considering clean air zones. We think the next ones that are probably due to go live will be Bradford and Portsmouth in later this year, early into next year. We've also developed then a CAS communications toolkit. So this is something that our members can print off co-brand um, to show that they have clean air zone compliant vehicles. So um, they can also give their customers or potential customers a lot of information about the clean air zones through this toolkit. Um, they can help people check vehicles to see if they're CAS compliant and also help people understand how they need to make payment if they are in an uncompliant vehicle. But hopefully it, it will help people see that our members have compliant vehicles. There is also a lookup tool. So if people are looking at how they can get compliant vehicles, they can go onto that lookup tool and see which of our members operate in their, in their area. There are, however, a number of challenges that need to be overcome, and I think commercial vehicles owners, operators need to be mindful of. So we have a whole myriad of different schemes. Um, I mentioned the London Ultra Low Emission Zone, that's um, owned and operated by Transport for London. The Clean Air Zones are then uh, operated by the local authorities under central government and the Joint Air Quality Unit. We're gonna see Scottish low emission zones come into play uh, early in 2022. And then we also have the Oxford zero emission zone, which is due to pilot later this year. The concern here, there's a couple of concerns. The concern mainly is that there's no single mechanism that will enable people to pay for these different schemes. So the ULES is different to the CASs, which are gonna be different to the LESs and the ZESs. So that's going to cause a lot of um, a huge burden, really, on a number of fleet operators. I'm also a little bit concerned about the similarity in some of the language. So the ultra low emission zone in London and the Scottish low emission zones are completely different and will operate in completely different ways. But with no sort of national communication on the different uh, schemes, this could cause a lot of confusion. So we know that clean air zones, if you don't have a compliant vehicle, then you, you have to, you know, you will be charged to enter the zone. In Scotland, it's very different. You cannot enter the zone. Unless you have a compliant vehicle, you will get charged a penalty charge notice if you enter the zone. So very, very different in the way that they operate. Um, which I think could potentially cause some confusion. There's also a lack of auto pay. So within London, we have the ULES and the congestion uh, charge, which enables people to pay via auto pay. So large fleets can have accounts that are set up and it will automatically take that payment. When we look at the clean air zones, the same functionality doesn't exist. The onus is very much on the operator to make payment for entering the zone. 
either seven days ahead of when they enter or six days after they've entered the zone. Otherwise, they'll get a penalty charge notice if in an uncompliant vehicle. Our concern with this is that a number of fleets operate nationally. They may be very used to going in and out of London um, and then they go into one of the other clean air zones and they're completely unaware of the way that they, they work. Um, we have seen some improvements, so one of the things that we would urge all local authorities is to send warning letters ahead of the introduction of any of the clean air zones, which also point people to the business accounts tool so that businesses can get prepared before the CASs go live. So you can put your uh, fleet of vehicles onto the, the portal and then it's all ready to go for when it goes live. But it is um, placing a huge burden on a number of fleet operators, particularly because not just because of the lack of auto pay, but also the fact that um, it was too difficult to extend the payment in arrears window from six days to seven. So this means that effectively a number of fleets are having to do uh, a telematics routine twice a week to consolidate the vehicles and then make appropriate payment for being in the clean air zones, which is just a huge burden. It would have been a lot easier to have done it on a weekly basis, um, but unfortunately we're having to do it twice a week. I mentioned communications and the lack of any sort of national communications. Um, there have been a number of localised communications, um, particularly ahead of Birmingham, Bath, etc. But again, many fleets travel nationally. So I am worried that people may not have seen some of the localised communications campaigns. And as I said before, if they are used to driving into areas where there is that auto pay functionality, they could get caught out um, because they, they know no better. Also some concerns around schemes that are introduced ahead of the technology being widely available. So I mentioned the Oxford zero emission zone um, that's due to pilot later this year, albeit on a small scale and with relatively low charges, it is due to expand next year and we may see other local authorities considering zero emission zones. I think, you know, with van supply, zero emission van supply being particularly strained, um, also, there's still issues with functionality of vehicles. So whilst we're on our sort of third, fourth generation of some of the early battery electric vehicles, like cars, like the Nissan Leaf, et cetera, we don't have the same functional requirements for, for vans yet. So there's no longer range uh, zero emission vans available or with towing options and things like that. So there are issues on that side. And also in terms of the scalability of some of the trucks, zero emission trucks, we're not just we're not seeing that just yet. So we are concerned that some of these schemes may be introduced ahead of the technology being widely available. And then there's huge inconsistencies in the funding. So it's great to see a number of the local authorities giving um, support to smaller businesses and helping them get into compliant vehicles. But quite often they don't recognize rental and leasing as an option. Um, the concern here is, you know, we, what we don't want is people to invest in a, in a CAS compliant truck that they're then going to have for 12, perhaps even 14 years or more. By leasing, at least it means that it gives people the agility that as zero emission transport becomes available, they can move as and when that happens within much shorter timescales. So we really would urge local authorities to, to look at rental and leasing as an option when they are giving that financial support to small businesses. There's also a lot of inconsistency as well in how different local authorities have interpreted state aid rules. Um, so without getting too technical, some of the local authorities are allowing operators to apply for funding if they operate for hire or reward, whereas others aren't. And, and it's hugely inconsistent. So it's something that we have spoken to central government about whether there could be some further guidance, but I'm not sure if that if the government really see it as, as their role, um, but we really are keen to engage with the local authorities to try and iron this out and make sure that we see greater consistency. And as I said, that we do see rental and leasing options being put forward. So in terms of how we make zero emission a reality, we're really keen that CASAs form part of the wider decarbonisation agenda. At the moment, it does feel a little bit like the whole air quality side of things is seen in isolation. And I think at a local authority um, sort of um, side of things, it was great to hear from the councillor earlier and the fact that it, it, it is being seen holistically. I'm not so confident in terms of central government where, you know, it's almost separate work streams when you look at decarbonisation versus clean air zones. So it's really important that it all ties in together. 
we need to ensure that we see the right balance of carrots and sticks. So with a lot of the clean air zones, it is the sort of heavier goods vehicles that are getting some very, very heavy penalties. You know, some local authorities charging £100 a day to enter. If we want people to move to zero emission transport as it becomes more widely available, we need to make sure that we're not sort of disincentivizing people because there's too many penalties and that people are able to make the move as and when that technology comes available. And then, as I've mentioned before, rental and leasing absolutely must be promoted as one of the ways to get people into compliant vehicles and so that they're able to move as and when zero emission um, technology becomes available. And then the final point I'd like to make is that policymakers really need to give more support to commercial vehicle uh, owners and operators um, when we look at zero emission, particularly around areas such as supply. I mentioned some of the supply issues for vans. Um, also, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the correct technological roadmap is going to be for trucks. Is it going to be hydrogen? We know battery electric might not work for all. There are some very unique specialist use cases where people need that constant onboard power. We don't think battery electric is going to be sufficient, but we need to know what that technology is and, and how things are developing and have much greater oversight of that. On the demand side, we would like to see some form of ring fence funding, particularly for vans. Um, there is a concern that, you know, right now we don't have the full range of functional vehicles, but as and when they do become available, a lot of the grant money may have been taken by getting people into cars, battery electric cars. So we want to ensure that there's some safeguarding there for vans and we'd like to see some form of ring fence funding and support there. And then the final areas on infrastructure. So quite often we see that charging bays aren't um, accessible for a lot of commercial vehicles, they're too small, the cables aren't long enough because of where the charging port is, but we also have the issue that a lot of um, commercial vehicle drivers will not be able to charge at home. So Centrica, British Gas, um, they've estimated that about 65% of their engineers that take their vans home will not be able to drive uh, to charge at home because they don't have a driveway. So we need to make sure that you know, any uh, differential between those that can and those that can't um, charge at home is ironed out. And we'd like to see more deployment of rapid charging for commercial vehicle operators that's away from the uh, motorway. So more in residential uh, trading estates and things like that. So um, thanks very much for listening to me and happy to take any questions as part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Some very good points there, particularly around the, uh, the the carrot and stick. I know if it's anything like the Dartford Crossing, I am going to be in for a whole world of trouble when it comes to going into clean air zones and if I've got a non-compliant vehicle, because I am hopeless at paying those fees. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, right, our next speaker is uh, is Ollie Korn, head of uh, CSR for DPD. I'm sure this is going to be very interesting. Ollie, are you there? Hello. Hi, George. Let me just uh, share my screen. Bear with me. Here we Can go. I just remind you all to um, keep submitting your questions if you do have them. Uh, we'll be answering them shortly. All right, we look like we're there. Hi, everyone. Yeah, hi, George. Can you hear me? Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ollie Crawn. I'm head of CSR at DPD. Uh, I'm here to talk about our journey in sustainability. So back in uh, early 2020, before uh, COVID really struck and, and our lockdown processes happened in the UK, we changed our three pillar strategy that had been in the business for well over 12 years to include a fourth box. And that really cemented our um, ambition and our strategy in sustainability and the decarbonisation of our fleet. And by putting that into sort of the ethos and strategy of the business, everyone is involved in that um, and really engaged in that process and that shift. Obviously helps when you do that because then everyone is focused on the same objective. 
And at the start of uh, 2020, we actually only had 149 electric vehicles in our fleet. Um, and in 2020, we had a strategy to deliver 10% of fleet in every single depot. So not just um, in central uh, urbanized areas like London, and Birmingham, but throughout the UK, no matter the territory of the delivery depot. And by the end of last year, we actually grew our fleet up to over 750 vehicles. And today, in fact, it is now reaching over 850 vehicles. Uh, we recently uh, publicized that we'd ordered well over 750 Maxis delivery vehicles. Um, and that will enable us to reach a fleet of 1,700 vehicles by the end of this year. So we are really all in on the transition to electric and our final mile delivery fleet. And with that, so far this year, we have delivered 6.5 million parcels on our all electric fleet. So just to put that into context, in 2019, we only delivered 1.3 million parcels on our all electric fleet, obviously a lot smaller back then, Last year, we achieved 11.2 million uh, parcels on our all electric fleet. And this year, with the incoming deliveries of, uh, of these vehicles, these Maxis vehicles, we expect to achieve over 20 million parcels delivered all electric this year. And with that, we've launched our Vision 25. So we've actually looked at the 25 most densely populated cities throughout the UK and have a plan to deliver them final mile all electric by 2025. By doing this, we'll deliver 25% of our volume in 2025 all electric to those cities. That's over 100 million parcels delivered and it will cover over 25% of the UK population. And this is our current EV fleet. So there's numerous vehicles here, numerous sizes. We started off with the sort of Nissan, Peugeot partner size vehicles and the Mercedes Vito because they were available. They were affordable um, and easily implemented within our business. However, like any parcel delivery uh, business, really the three and a half ton van is the workhorse of the fleet because we're a collection and delivery. So we need to collect parcels, process them, deliver them. And you need the space, the cubic um, load space and the weight. So we ordered 100 man ETGEs last year, back in January, and they were delivered throughout the year. However, they had to be shipped to the UK and transformed into right-hand drive vehicles. They were only manufactured left-hand drive. So there are those challenges, but I'm glad to say that in recent times, in the last 12 to 18 months, the three and a half ton electric market has really um, started to open up. Right hand vehicles, right hand drive vehicles have been manufactured, are available. And, you know, as with our Maxis, our recent order of the ED9, 500 of those, um, we're looking at other manufacturers as well as the traditional European manufacturers. There's a lot of vehicles coming to market. It's a very interesting time, but we need to keep that momentum and really keep incentivizing this transition to enable um, you know, the demand to rise and, and manufacturers to really make that transition investment. You can see though that it's not just the vans, we have some cargo bikes, it's an area that we are looking to grow. We have the Paxter, which is quite a peculiar vehicle. Um, it's used by Norwegian Post quite widely. Um, and it's like a quad electric quad bike, it's ideal for sort of London, and other urbanized areas like Birmingham. And then we have only two seven and a half all, all electric vehicles that actually um, provide, they, they bring the volume into our central urban uh, depots in the ULES zone in London. So the whole operation is fully all electric. Um, so this is an area definitely seven and a half ton above where the market really needs to, to move forward. Um, and you know, we're still seeing that these vehicles 
three and a half turn upwards and still extremely um, expensive. There's obviously some savings in the running cost, the total ownership. Um, but just to put it into sort of comparison, a diesel um, sprinter, for example, would cost DPD around £25,000. The electrical equivalent would be probably forty-four to £45,000. So huge upfront cost if you're buying the vehicle outright. Um, and we still need to ensure that government subsidizes that. There have been some changes, obviously, at the start of this year. I think they need to be published more widely. So, you know, businesses, um, people like DPD, but also especially small to medium businesses can plan their transition and budget for that, knowing what what's going to change. Because when uh, grant systems are obviously uh, changed at short notice, People would have created financial plans over many years and they need to factor that in. So it'd be really important to open that communication. And then charging. Charging is probably the most challenging, uh, scary point of this transition. Um, we actually have uh, a majority of our drivers are what we call owner driver franchisees, they're service partners. They work for DPD, they're branded um, DPD, they're fantastic individuals, providers, an amazing service uh, and brand reputation. And they either lease or purchase their own vehicle, at least leasing, leasing that through DPD. And not all of them have home charging. Some of the um, other speakers have obviously raised the, these challenges. We have about 41% of drivers um, home charging. We actually pay for the charger. Along with the £350 OSEF grant, we pay up to £350 towards it as well. And then it's theirs to keep. So there, it's an incentive for them to transition to electric. Um, but obviously, when you're in urbanised areas, parts of Birmingham, London, Manchester, Leeds, etc., it's much harder to have off-street parking. And that's where the challenge comes in. So we are... Um, upgrading some of our charging networks in our depots. Several years ago, when we started this journey, we actually started to install 3.7 kilowatt chargers, which now, with the size of vehicle and battery, is the equivalent of trying to fill a swimming pool with a dripping tap. It just it, it is not going to work. So we've started to upgrade and increase the kilowatt chargers. So we can have fast chargers, it's convenient, it's a supporting um, element for our owner driver population as well. But as well as home charging being the priority strategy, public charging has to play a huge role in this. We have charge partnerships, we've transitioned our fuel cards um, that are typically for ICE diesel vehicles, they also have an element where you can use it for charging vehicles and electric vehicles. So we're utilizing that mechanism. We're in talks with um, various organizations in the UK that will help us provide as many um, charging options for our drivers. Um, well over 16,000 public chargers across the UK. However, there's still challenges as it's been discussed prior to, to my conversation the charge bays are, are typically built for cars. Um, sometimes when the, they're tethered, um, the charge to get the charger to the vehicle um, charging socket, there's huge challenges. There's also potential brand damage that our vans are taking up public charges and people complain about that. You know, I, there needs to be more investment. There needs to be more momentum. It needs to go quicker. Um, I can't really emphasize that enough. And maybe charging hubs for fleets because it's not just DPD. There are competitors, there are council vehicles, um, there are numerous other businesses that are going to make this transition, small to medium as well, or even self-employed you know, builders, plumbers, etc., that would utilize a, a, a van, you know, a light commercial vehicle. So we really need to look at pushing that forward and, and helping people um, be attracted to that transition, not to be able to say, well, it's not going to work. And that is one of the most important parts of this journey. It's about looking at what you can do and not what you can't do.
Um, everyone should make a start and start that transition. With our rollout of electric vehicles, we have started with low mileage routes that can be completed within the range of the vehicle, as well as drivers getting to home and back. Um, and obviously we're supplying them with charging options. So that also helps transition. But it's about the low hanging fruit and taking that and then looking at tech when technology evolves that we can reach further, higher range um, or faster charging. So it's about making change now to help that transition and that momentum. It's not all about electric though. At the moment, the larger vehicles, you know, there's a question mark between electric and hydrogen, obviously, but alternative fuels are an option. We've invested in natural gas trucks, but we also actually try and do something with the fleet that we already have. So we monitor the MPG of our drivers and they're actually rewarded for uh, good MPG standards. So we're obviously making a saving in fuel costs, but also helping reduce our emissions by driving uh, more intelligently, more economically. Um, and we also pass on part of that saving to our drivers to really sort of engage them and get make them aware. With that, we also ensure that idling is, um, is stopped um, with, with drivers. So they're rewarded for that as well. So we monitor the telematics of those items and, and reward them and engage them, make them understand of the impact of that. Um, so again, it's what you can do with the technology that's currently available or the operation that you currently run, you can make those changes. If everyone makes a small change, you know, it will have a great impact. So it's about making change and not just waiting for that perfect moment because there won't be one. OK. And then just moving on, it's happy um, clean air day. So, you know, back in uh, August last year, DPD launched our Project Breathe, it's an air quality monitoring system. We work with a company called Pollute Track, the, and we've fitted uh, particle, um, particle matter, particular matter 2.5 monitors to our vehicles and some fixed locations. We've fitted 100 in London and 20 at uh, their mobile sensors, and then 20 fixed low, um, sensors in pickup shop networks close to schools and playgrounds, ideally to ensure that we monitor the best place um, to have the bigger impact. And that, um, that information's collated, it's in a dashboard format that we can share with local authorities and academic institutions to make improvements. And then this year, we expanded that network of sensors and these cities are all live now. So Birmingham was installed before Easter, um, we are in talks with the local authorities and Birmingham University to share that because it will give a great picture of pre and post CAS zone that was launched earlier this month um, and hopefully really sort of show the impact that it has there. Um, but this information is free. We've created this, this project because we believe that we have the facilities to utilise um, uh, our vehicles and our operations to really cast the net widely with mobile sensors especially to give a greater picture and to help public um, service and academic institutions with their studies in air quality because obviously it's extremely important that our urban areas are um, safe uh, for the population. And with that, we've even installed um, a part of the um, Project Breathe information into our DPD delivery app. So if you're a consumer and you live in one of those six cities, you will be able to see the air quality index um, in, in that area for the day. And also it tells you the last 30 days. So it's again, bringing awareness to air quality. Hopefully that will drive behavioral changes Maybe in Birmingham, instead of taking your car, public transport, bicycle, walking, and, and that will really drive change. And then air quality is not just all about tailpipe emissions. Tires play their part, brakes play their part. And we are launching a trial with a company called Enzo. Um, 
in London uh, in an electric depot um, to trial the tyres. It has an increased durability and should prove that it creates lower tyre emissions. Tyres account for approximately 60% of all particulate matter 2.5 emissions. So it's really important that we don't just focus on decarbonisation of fleet, but all the other elements of our operation too. And then finally, I just want to touch on a really great initiative that DPD has um, in the business. So the Eco Fund, we actually gather up all our use shrink wrap in our hubs. So again, it's another uh, environmental sustainability uh, initiative, not just vehicles. To um, bail our use shrink wrap, we sell it onto a business that actually breaks it down and creates fresh shrink wrap. So it's a circular economy initiative. And then what we do with that money, that, that revenue it, it brings, we actually donate that. So we have an eco fund. You can apply from the DPD Green website, which is green.dpd.co.uk. And we've donated well over £250,000 um, since February last year. And that includes a, a project with Forestry England where we've actually planted nearly 80,000 trees um, after wildfire in a forest on the south coast. So again, small changes like gathering shrink wrap can really make a great difference. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, so we still have some uh, time for some questions. Uh, there's not not many coming in at the moment, but I'm sure they'll they'll build as we go on. So if we can invite um, John, Colin, Catherine, and um, Ollie's still here. Good. Um, let we let's start off with uh, what was the first one? John, batteries. Um, firstly, there's a lot of questions. A lot of people wanting to know. Uh, what the life expectancy of the batteries are on the Volvo truck, uh, and also about the recycling options. So yeah, we, uh, we the battery life obviously will uh, depend on how you how you use it. So again, uh, we uh, in our um, energy range calculator, we uh, we look at the battery life. So when we uh, we do an assessment of the route, we will look at it over the years to see if you can continually do that route. So we. We know the degradation. Obviously, the performance of the battery depends on whether you go for DC or AC charging. Uh, but typically, we'd be, be looking between eight and ten years. And again, we have the, the benefit of the bus fleet to, to look at to draw down uh, that data data from, because obviously we started doing hybrid buses way back in 2009. Um, with regards to the uh, to the battery, uh, obviously, when it's when it's used, it's not finished. It still has a, a re, another another life with regards to repurposing, and we have a, a company that we just set up recently called Volvo Energy uh, to look at and manage that within the uh, the power generation side uh, of the business. Uh, great. Uh, I don't know if you can see the the questions there, John, but if you look at, look at the yeah. second the second one down, there's um there's a very lengthy question for you. I'll let you read that um, and then I'll come back to you on that one. It's basically our Volvo and other, other OEMs not missing opportunity to help decarbonize the amount of truck operators um, that use diesel power for their vehicles. But as you'll see, there's a few more questions on there. Um, while John does that, let's uh, go to this next question. Uh, will the freight portal include an interactive and uh, co continued updated map for alternative fuels for refueling points? I think that's one for you there, Colin. Yep, no problem. I can't start my video because the host has blank blanked me, but don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, start my video. Okay, yep. So, um, good question. Um, we do have a, a section on alternative fuels, and uh, I think an interactive map for all of those would probably be a good good thing to do if there's nothing else out there already. Uh, part of the freight portal is that we don't want to try and reinvent the wheel. Um, so if there's something out there already, then we can have links to it. But if there's something that actually we feel needs to be out there and pulled together, then I think we can go to DFT and say, I think this is a very valid project to include, uh, whether it's LNG, CNG, refueling, uh, charge points, etc. There's lots of like Zap Map is out there. Um, pulling that together specifically for freight operators is probably a good thing to do. So it's probably in the in the pipeline. Good, glad to hear. 
Uh, John, are you ready to come back to us with something? Yeah, I've, I've, I've read the question and I think um, it might be interesting if uh, Catherine has a view on it. It's about how we phase out and phase in. So uh, I, I swerved that over to Catherine there a little bit. But uh, past, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have obviously, we, we've got a target towards 2030. And again, we again going back to that timeline on the graph, you can see the drop. Um, but again, obviously our phase out will be towards 2040. So you'll have a period where, where diesel uh, will be there. Obviously, how it's managed, uh, I mean, as I say, some of the issues with regard to this technology is it, it's there. We can do it. I mean, uh, electric's been around since 1898 when Porsche worked for Lerner, but it, it disappeared. So the technology is not necessarily new. It's a lot further developed. Charging structure is there. It needs to be adopted. It's the circular issues of, of, of making a commercial vehicle, as, as Ollie, as, and making it work for you uh, that is the, the, the key issue. So... You know, the, 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 the phase in and phase out uh, will be interesting. We still uh, believe in uh, uh, car net carbon because of the size of the vehicles, but we'll see how technology uh, develops over that roadmap. And then obviously, we, as we phase in and phase out, we have, we have the residual value of, a, of an EV, and then we have also the residual value of, of, of the diesel uh, to consider. So um, yeah, we do need uh, uh, a 10-year timescale uh, how, how we've mapped it, looking looking to drop towards 2030, but probably the the general phase out of fossil free, uh, of fossil fuels by 2040. Hopefully, that kind of answers the question. Uh, but like everything, then it's a bit like Betamax and uh, VHS. Nobody knew that the D DVD was going to come along, and then streaming came too. Yeah, that's it. There's always something um, else to overtake the next. So, um, uh, Catherine, do you have anything to add on that? Has, has John put you on the hot seat there? <laughs> I think what I would add is, you know, when, when we responded to the uh, phase-out question and the consultation that the government ran last year on, on cars and vans, one of the things we were clear to stress was that we needed a delivery plan from the government. So across supply, demand and infrastructure, what are they going to commit to and what do we need to see by when to enable us to make that transition? So we are expecting a consultation to come out on the phase out of trucks um, anytime soon, I think. Um, so hopefully when that comes out and we've responded to that, we can push for a similar delivery plan because I think you need everything working simultaneously to be able to meet those targets. So, so that, that's, I suppose, is what I would add to that. Fair enough. Um, the residual value um, depends on how much battery is left with the vehicle. You know, you've got a vehicle standing that needs new battery for, for the second life, or, the, or you're, you're going to put batteries in two years earlier than planned. You know, the next purchaser may get six years advantage out of that. So it is a diff completely different model. Mm. Yes, definitely. Uh, Catherine, um, how do you see the rental and leasing industry supporting the drive to zero? Um, that's a pretty open-ended question, I suppose. But Yeah, so I mentioned um, in my opening that we have a, a plug-in pledge. So by 2025, we're saying that um, our members will be responsible for 80% of all battery electric vehicles that are purchased in the UK. So obviously, we can help people get into zero emission transport. Um, Ollie mentioned, you know, starting small and starting where, where you've got sort of I suppose vehicles that can make those electric journeys. So our members will work with their customers to make sure that they understand where it's feasible, where it's viable. Um, but I guess the other point I would make from a sort of rental and car club perspective is it's not decarbonisation isn't just about getting everybody to switch from a, a diesel or petrol vehicle into a into an electric vehicle or a, another zero emission. You know, in terms of cars, I think there's a lot more we can do in terms of ownership, usership. Um, making people think a lot more smartly about how they use vehicles, but with a lot of policymakers, certainly on the car side, the car is sometimes seen as the enemy. Um, and, you know, we look at people trying to, to restrict car movement, but actually we do need cars. And I think that needs to be recognised. Um, so, you know, when we do look at decarbonisation, it's making sure that the, the role of cars is recognised and that people can use car clubs and rental and things like that to make part of their journeys, which otherwise they can use public transport, um, they can cycle, they can walk, but we, we still do need a car. So yeah, that was the other point on decarbonisation. Um, a question, I guess, first one to put your hand up or rather the last one to step back from it maybe, I'll, I'll 
pick a face and uh, assign the, the task. Does this, the existing substantial fuel network of petrol stations have a part to play in the role of infrastructure for alternative fuel, fuels, or is this uh, not cost effective at the moment? Who's going to be brave? I think that, that could be uh, one for Colin. Oh, that's a good one. Um, obviously, there's assets there that are selling something that might not be uh, uh, used as much as it used to. So I think we'll see um, perhaps a re uh, a reallocation of what they're actually providing. So you could be having you know, rapid charge hubs or something like that. So um, I, I suspect that there'll be uh, the issue with obviously alternative fuels is that you know, how many tanks have they got? What you know can they be mixed, etc. So uh, we have this uh, the E10 coming in, and that's obviously creating some some challenges. Uh, in terms of what the infrastructure is and uh, what you have to have to continually have available. So um, I think it will just be, you know, business models will change and uh, what products they are selling on those four courts will, will change as well. Absolutely. At the end of the day, their businesses, aren't they? They're going to be looking to um, diversify their offerings and try and keep with the times because if uh, fuel sales drop, then um, they've got to find some way of filling those gaps. So there are shareholders to report to. Mm. Um, anybody else want to contribute on that one? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, um, oh. sorry. Regards sorry, John, to, go ahead. Oh, sorry, with regards to hydrogen, um, again, what we've learned from gas is, is we can't do it on our own. And, uh, you know, it's not chicken and egg. You've got to work, uh, work together and, and gas works really well because the gas, the gas infrastructure has worked with the vehicle manufacturers, has worked with the operators. And you know, it's now not an alternative for us. It's our second most popular model. What we're doing with hydrogen, of course, is um, there's, a, there's a H2 Accelerate, which is a group of uh, vehicle manufacturers uh, and the well, energy companies now, they're not oil companies, uh, working together uh, with that transition. So uh, the, the traditional vehicle manufacturers and the traditional uh, energy companies are, are working together, obviously, to, uh, to help support that uh, transition. Thank you, John. Right, David. uh, David's appeared back in the room, so um, got something to add? He's listening intently. So um, what I'd say is, that, so typically a forecourt will sit on a kind of roughly a half an acre. So our refueling station fits on two and a half acres to give you a feel for scale, because you, you, you potent, you're potentially storing a lot of um, gaseous fuel, for example, in terms of hydrogen um, or, or bo bottles and compressors for compressed natural gas. So um, I know that a lot of refueling stations are being repurposed and that's being some, given some consideration, but you know, you've know got to think about blast zones, combining fuels, which the HSC will say, uh, Dangerous Substance Act, which wasn't thought about when those original fueling stations were put in place. So there will be some role, but I think there also needs to be a complete you know, ripping up the, draw, you know, the, the drawing plans and, and starting from scratch again with something that's fit for purpose for today. Mm, absolutely, and also probably thinking about what the, the the afterlife for those filling stations are again as now if we decommissioning fuel stations they've um clean like cleaning the the ground and having them um redone for residential or for commercial properties a, a mammoth task because of all the the bunkering and stuff that's gone underneath them so i guess for i hadn't thought of a blast zone and that uh, <laughs> that problem but, for but, but, but your, your point about underground tanks we purposely put overground tanks for that exact reason so you're right a lot of stations will have a, a massive cleanup costs Great, thank you very much for coming back on that. Um, uh, now begins the DPD section of the uh, <laughs> of the questions. <laughs> Ollie's been sitting there quietly. We've got more than enough uh, to keep him busy for a while. Uh, let's start off with: Was the green strategy at DPD down? Uh, sorry, top down with budget set aside from the get go, or has it uh, grown gradually? Have you found economic benefits, or is it all CSR based? It's definitely not CSR face. Was that the terminology? Or? CSR based, yeah. Oh, based. Oh, okay. Um, with our journey started back in 2013, we actually, I know these words can be met with a lot of cynicism, but we started to offset our emissions for our parcels. At the time, electric vehicles weren't really commercially viable, but as they've come to market, we've obviously embraced those, continue to move forward. You can see the rapid growth of our fleet, you know, from my presentation and, you know, there, there are not, sadly, at the moment, any real economic benefits from that. We feel it's the right 
thing to do. We understand that obviously our operation delivering parcels creates CO2 emissions and the transition is, it has to happen, you know, now the technology is around, we can invest, we can budget. And like I said, there's a lot of people that sitting on the sidelines waiting for the perfect solution. There, is, there never will be a perfect solution. And if everyone makes a transition, it will create a momentum a need for this technology to move forward and hopefully bring down cost and mean that we'll move at a greater pace. You know, this is the defining decade. If we don't do something now, I don't know about you guys, it was bright sunshine last week. It's now starting to pour down with rain. You know, there was uh, on the radio the other day, there was talk about, you know, um, properties as well, about safeguarding to weather, you know, um, weather changes so you, we know there's some things going on we need to act as quickly as possible if we start to do something it's better than you know one person doing it all and the others continuing in the same vein definitely um, here's an interesting thought for you uh, is there a role for shared deliveries between parcel companies to reduce the number of vans on residential streets <laughs> it, it's an idea and a, a theory that does get talked about it, consolidation centers um it doesn't just automatically half the amount of vehicles on the road it won't do that but i think there's a lot of complexities to ask of dpd we see ourselves as a, a premium delivery parcel business you if you've ever got a parcel from dpd hopefully it's fantastic service you get your one hour window it's on time you know we do all the things we do others in the industry pitch their service at, at different levels as you would do in other services. And the argument would be, we wouldn't want our parcels really delivered by someone turning up in a, I don't know, a Y-Reg banger with blue smoke coming out the back of it with a high vis on and, you know, jean, ripped jeans and, and trainers. That's not what we sell. And also that would go totally against our all, all electric strategy you know, so there's a lot of challenges as well as software integration. How do you pay? Who pays what for the parcel journey? It's it's a massive, massive issue. I think um, as volume increases, you know, there'll be more transition to bikes, you know, walking deliveries, much like sort of post post era, uh, postman era. But there are studies suggesting, and I remember Catherine saying about cars being seen as the bad guy. I think fleet, if they're the bad guy, I don't know what fleets are, you know, fleet vans, you know, um, because people love what we're doing, but there are some, you know, what if, if it continues e-commerce to grow, how many vans are gonna be on the road? But there are studies that suggest that actually e-commerce delivery is about 36% less pollutive than your general bricks and mortar retail because we're delivering 150 plus parcels in one vehicle. That could be 150 plus car journeys into a residential shopping area. You know, so you know, there's no no solution is perfect. It just needs to be a balance. I think. Thank you, Ollie. We've got another one for you um, in a minute, but just on a related point, someone's asked any thoughts on relating to urban consolidation and micro hubs and the redesign of delivery network and the challenges and potential. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got any thoughts on, on that. We've sort of touched upon um, on that, but if anybody wants to put their hand up, then go ahead. Uh, no, I'll okay, fair enough. <laughs> go on, Ollie. Uh, you know, we, back in 2018, you know, before the ULES was launched, we launched our first all electric micro site in Westminster, in the heart of Westminster. Um, and we continue to roll that out. We have Shoreditch, uh, Park Lane as well. So we've actually utilised a lot of properties that you wouldn't really associate with delivery industry. You know, Park Lane's um, an underground car park, a section of that that we've utilised. Um, we've, we've launched one outside of London in Hull. And the reason for that is that our main depot that serves it, Hull, is about 26 miles away. So most of the drivers live in Hull with an electric vehicle. They'd have to drive 26 miles to the depot, load up, then 26 miles back and do that journey again and their route. And with the route range, obviously, and the sort of wasted stem mileage, we opened up a, a little urban site in the centre of Hull and actually increased our electric vehicles in the city because of that. So they just drive straight in, 
there's a lot less mileage, less congestion, obviously, because they're not driving into the city from some outside. So it's it, it's it works. You know, urban urban logistics does work. It's just the cost of it. Property is still in these urban areas, no matter how small it is at a premium. To put it into perspective, our Westminster site is our most expensive site per square foot in the entire network. Um, you know, I think maybe with uh, some of the issues with retail, retail properties will come about uh, and maybe uh, reduce that cost and, and increase opportunities. But then you start getting uh, residential, obviously, uh, people in their apartments, et cetera, may be complaining about noise. Electric vehicles are cheap, um, are quieter, obviously, but you still have the operational element of people. And when you start sort of getting a bit too close in those two environments, there can be issues. Um, absolutely, sort of a field of dreams slash Wayne World thing of um, build it and they will come, I think is <laughs> the way it will work with, with the infrastructure, isn't it? Um, Right, rapid fire round. Um, John, does rapid charging reduce battery life? Go. Yes. <laughs> yes, there we go. Um, and what, over what sort of time period are we looking at and what, um, what's an acceptable amount of degradation on a battery? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a diff, it's a difficult one to, to, to answer on that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for now. As I say, it, we, we we yeah we, we know that obviously if you if you do a lot of dc charging it it will uh, it will it will drop significantly that's why we need to do all the consultation uh before but again during the consultation we can look at the battery life through our um, our simulator and the, uh, the equipment that we have so it's horses for courses so we need to look at each operation independently yeah fair enough that makes sense um, residual values on EVs, given the uncertainty of battery life. Uh, Catherine, something that um, your members are worried about? Uh, residual values, potentially, yes. Um, particularly as we see sort of newer models coming and also, you know, how are you going to incentivize someone to choose uh, a second hand battery electric vehicle over its sort of ICE equivalent. So we are doing some work on, on used BEVs. Um, and how we get more of a healthy market, but also looking at the fiscal that may be required for residual values as well. So it's something we're looking at. Good. Um, another question for you here. Would some form of universal in-vehicle data meter in uh, rental vehicles make it easier to pay for congestion zones and charging type systems? Well, I think it would, but would that be possible? Uh, data and data access and what we can and can't get access to is huge um, and I wouldn't even attempt to tackle it right now but um, potentially you know there are solutions but particularly as we look at sort of shared mobility models and the ability to pay for for end-to-end -end journeys there is the possibility that I know government did look at telematics and if that could help in terms of making some of the payment but I think it it's just not there across the field to enable people to do that. I don't know if Ollie's got anything to sort of add on to that, but I'm, I'm not, yeah, I don't think we're where we need to be. Ollie? I think with higher, higher vehicles, obviously, uh, maybe rentals, there's there's a more of a complexity, isn't there, with the GDPR element and the consumer, etc. With fleets, we have the handheld unit the driver uses pings every two minutes so we know the locations and that could be used to obviously understand where a parcel may have, have gone amiss or, or there'd been an incident etc um but we don't monitor obviously where that vehicle goes unless we really need you know need to investigate it's sort of um it's not a big brother style it's purely for um safety and, and security um really but i, I think yeah you you're gonna have trouble uh, monitoring people's movements I think the, the other would thing I was to... at yeah, sorry I was just going to say the other thing I was at we have got some members who are using telematics to consolidate where their vehicles have, have been to make payment for the CASs and it's it's become somebody's full-time job because they're having to do it two times a week without the, the auto pay functionality it, it's a massive massive burden so I'm not sure it would actually solve the problem yeah very good point uh, I'd just like to add, add to that if that's okay, George, the, to solve the problem would be to be CAS compliant. That, that, that would be the best thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very good point. Yes. <laughs> um, another one for you here, uh, Ollie. With the growth in home delivery and the quest for faster and faster delivery services, as this goes back to what we've, we, we said earlier, um, are there plans to offer slower delivery options for customers who prefer to improve the environment than receive the, their delivery in 24 hours? I mean, it's that how urgent is urgent yeah. question, really, isn't it? Well, we uh, holding parcels could actually create a bigger issue. Our optimization in our business is second to none. So our vehicles uh, and the routes are optimized to its fullest potential within the legal working hours, obviously. By holding parcels, you may actually need to then increase the amount of vehicles on the road that day and maybe uh, actually run it only half empty. So actually then that's inefficient, not environmentally friendly. Um, what we do is obviously transition to electric. We also, every parcel in DPD is delivered um, carbon neutral. So, you know, I think it, you need to be careful, people need to be careful with, with people selling a service that they're saying is more economical just because they've delayed it. What, how do you actually verify that it's more economical and environmentally friendly? Uh, I feel like, you know, delivering something the next day isn't a bad thing. It's the way you do it and with what means of, of delivery. Um, I think sometimes uh, integrity is obviously an extremely important piece in this whole transition as well, isn't it? I think. That's a very good point you made there. See um, Colin nodding along. Yeah, quite safely I, I, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting aspect. Obviously, Energy Saving Trust is very involved in behaviour change and people making the right choices well they have to have the information that's correct and trust the information that they're making those choices on um, so is it better to have uh, a, ho a delivery to your home by an electric van or is it better to walk to a, a locker and pick it up yourself or is it a click and collect aspect and being able to differentiate those or judge those of which is 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 the most environmentally friendly will take a lot of data and a lot of let's say um verification to make sure that actually this choice is the best choice for you so um i think there's work going on in that in terms of you know consolidation centers lockers etc um but i think there needs to be a lot of data to back that up to say yep this choice that you're making uh is is the best choice to have um i think the retailers probably have a part to play when you're actually buying the uh, the goods and do you have a, a button to click to say I want it in the most environmentally friendly way delivered to me and my time scale is this or my convenience level of convenience is this um, that's quite a complicated uh, calculation to make but one yeah, that absolutely. might help um, you know, uh, I suppose a so-called green certificate might help change people's behavior but i think there's got to be a lot sitting behind it that actually makes that is that really a green you know the greenest way to do it yeah ollie uh, i think on, on that as well it goes to the scope one two three emissions and that actually the what the company could be actually delivering something more efficiently but again it goes back to the amount of cars going to pick up it's how you you know, and we do have a, a substantial pickup network as well, so people don't have to always have it delivered to their home. And they can actually opt for a different day as well for delivery. Um, but what you could be doing is saving CO2 your emissions as an operation, but then actually passing it on to the, the consumer. And then you've got potentially X amount of people driving to a pickup, uh, a, a, you know, a, collect, a collection point to get their parcel and it, that again it's just you you're actually not actually being more environmentally friendly you're just putting it the co2 somewhere else um so there's that element obviously if it's in city and you can get public transport walk or cycle there that's fantastic isn't it so yeah. um thank you yeah i'm just going to ask you all all to um give me one last point we nearly reached our time so you could think about um this question from me which is where would you suggest uh, people or operators start if they're interested in transitioning to zero carbon? So give them a, a, a little final bit of advice where to look at. It might be your own resources or it might be something else from Ollie from your own experiences or what you've, um, you've found in, um, in making that transition. Uh, and while you think about that, in the meantime, uh, John, we have a technical question here for you, which is 
how can we identify the switch between fuels when using both drops and fuels such as HVO with diesel on the same vehicle um, so we can see the fuel consumption and identify the carbon emissions for both? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one because, of course, you're using the same tank. So as a drop in fuel, you can have HVO. And if you haven't got HVO, you can put the diesel back in it because it is synthetic diesel. So, yeah, it, it, it will be a difficult one to monitor on the on the on the vehicle telematics so yeah unfortunately uh, you, you won't be able to, um, uh, to 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 register that change but ideally getting back to a point Oliver made you know just see how, how, how far you can run on HVO you know just yeah. use the diesel if, if you need to on, on, on the fuel card you know so yeah and I suppose the, the key thing there again probably from David's point of view is, is the growth in the in the HVO um, availability you know we have various pumps of, at, 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 uh, at the petrol and diesel stations and uh, HVO is obviously not freely available. Maybe that's a, a growth area we need to consider there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. So um, so by way of a conclusion, if you could all give me a, a little one-liner on um, on where you'd suggest people would, would look to if they wanted to start this process of um, zero carbonisation. Uh, who, who should we start with? Colin, is, Colin yep. looks eager. Yeah, I'd say that the first step is uh, understanding your energy efficiency or your efficiency at the moment, um, getting the baseline, uh, being able to calculate your MPG and monitoring that. Uh, are your operations as efficient as they possibly can be? Are you, you know, fully loading your trucks? Are you uh, eliminating empty running? And then once you think, well, I've got the efficiency, the operational efficiency as best I can, then right, what's the next step? Alternative fuels alternative vehicles, alternative energy sources. Very good point. Uh, Catherine? Uh, I would say speak to one of our members in terms of how you can get into as compliant zero emission vehicles. They've got the knowledge and expertise to help people make that journey. So yeah, speak to one of our members. Wise words. Uh, John? Uh, similar to Catherine, uh, uh, come and speak to your, your local uh, Volvo, Volvo dealer. Um, and again, uh, taking on Colin's point, obviously have a look at the efficiencies that you have with your with your current fleet. You know, do you really need, when you look at your Vecto score, do you really need six per two tractors with a four by two do? But yeah, by all means, come and, and, come and speak to us. Thank you. Uh, Ollie? Don't be overwhelmed. Look at what you can do, not what you can't do, and at least start something because then that it's like anything, it will start that movement towards other initiatives. Don't sit still, you know, get off the chair and get moving. Yeah, get that ball rolling. Yeah, make yeah. make the commitment to do something. Yeah. And um and finally, David, you're back. Uh, what would you like to add? Yeah, thank you. I think Oliver's point there sums it up perfectly. Just you have to start something. So, and and what we, I mean, it's just selfishly talking about Ties Energy Park, we purposely um, teamed up with Circus Energy, so they have a, a liquid fuel offering. So you can come and use your vehicles today and look at that transition to to cleaner alternatives. But also just being on a site where you're next to someone that's refueling on a bio CNG or hydrogen or electric means that there's then dialogue going on between drivers to say, oh, well, that's a bit quieter. I quite like that. And, and just challenging, you know, what are the costs? What are the, the kind of funding um, opportunities out there? But that, that's kind of, we, we desperately want that to happen. You know, we've got to jointly learn from everybody. We've got to start thinking about how you jointly procure. Um, but yeah, start now. Great. Thank you very much. And I would just like to add to that. You can always um, check back on Freight in the City because there'll be information and support from um people like yourselves and, um, and stories there that would, would help. So um, thank you very much. Um, it's been a, a wonderful half day of, um, of knowledge and um, I hope to see you all soon. And uh, thank you everybody for listening. The material will be available on Freight and City and this webinar will be broadcast uh, on YouTube and put on the website uh, by tomorrow. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.